This happened to me a couple of years back. Never quite been the same since. My name's Dorian, and I'm an avid outdoorsman by hobby. Work in retail management. You should see the crap I deal with there. Anyway, my only escape is nature. That's why I got hooked on RV life. Nothing like hitting the open road with my home in tow. Last summer, after a particularly nasty week at work, I decided to head west. I'd heard Yosemite National Park was spectacular. All those giant cliffs and waterfalls. I figured it was the perfect reset I needed. I rented a decent-sized RV with all the essentials. The drive out to California was long, but it put me in the right mindset. You get that sense of anticipation, a shedding of the mundane stuff from real life. It's exhilarating in its own way. I rolled into Yosemite just before sunset, found a campground at the far end of the park. Smaller, less known, right up my alley since I wasn't one for crowds. As soon as I stepped out of the RV, I knew I'd hit gold. I could smell the pine and hear the faint rush of a river in the distance. That night, with the sky full of stars, I felt more alive than I had in ages. Next morning, I woke up fully relaxed, made breakfast, and laced up my hiking boots. This is where things took a weird turn. While on a trail deeper in the woods, I came across a ramshackle cabin. Seemed abandoned and run down, something nobody'd used in years. Curiosity got the better of me. You watch too many wilderness documentaries, you start picturing grizzled mountain men and lost history. There was this weird symbol carved into the door of the cabin, not something I recognized. Didn't give it much thought, figuring it was hiker graffiti or maybe an old hobo sign. Took some pictures, figured I'd do some research on it later for fun. The rest of the day I enjoyed, took another long hike, cooked dinner overlooking one of the valleys, typical tourist trip. But I couldn't shake the image of that cabin. It had felt unnerving somehow. When it got dark, I settled in, planning to get an early start the next day. That's when it started. At first, I thought it was wind whipping through the trees, making a whistling sound. But it kept getting louder, more persistent, and it wouldn't stop. I sat bolt upright in the RV's tiny bed, trying to figure out what it was. Then it finally struck me. It wasn't the wind. It was someone out there, calling in a high-pitched, eerie way. Like half bird, half human. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. This continued throughout the night, and I got zero sleep. As the sky slowly began to lighten, the chilling calls finally faded away. At that point, I was on full-blown freak-out mode, packed up everything in record time, then hauled out of the campground like a maniac. Didn't look back once. Back on the highway, it took a minute to get my wits back. What the hell was that thing in the woods? A prankster messing with folks? Some crazy person living in the wilds? It didn't really compute. It just felt... wrong. Too animalistic too strange. My rational brain fought against what I'd heard, but I knew what I'd experienced. There was something unsettling about that place, something deep within those silent forests. Even while checking into a random motel on the drive home, I kept my phone close, ready to dial 911 at the first hint of trouble. I spent a sleepless night there too, constantly jolting awake in a cold sweat. Later that day, back in civilization, I finally got internet signal. Tried researching the symbol I'd seen on the cabin door. It wasn't a common one. Nothing in my immediate search results. I ventured onto some more obscure sites, dedicated to folklore and local legends. Nothing much came up. It just seemed like that weird cabin symbol was... Well, it was lost in history. In the years since, I've gone camping again but never alone. And I stick to popular parks, avoiding any remote spots. No reason to tempt fate, right? And the sound of that whistling call, well, that'll haunt me forever. Sometimes, if the wind howls just right, I swear I hear an echo of it. My blood runs ice cold every damn time. It's a sharp reminder. There are things out there the internet doesn't explain. 
things beyond maps and trails and curated experiences. There's a hidden side to the wild, something ancient and indifferent, watching us from places we're not meant to tread. I experienced it firsthand, and that knowledge forever changed me. This happened to me a few years back. Seems like forever ago. It was my usual fall camping trip, something I looked forward to all year long. Every autumn, I load up my RV and go deep into the forests to soak in the solitude. It's just me and nature, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm no survivalist. Far from it, actually. I grew up a city kid with all the modern conveniences, but there's something about unplugging for a week that really resets me. This year, I took my trip to the heart of the Ozarks in Arkansas. This place just sings to me. You've got those rolling hills, crystal clear rivers, and enough dense trees to truly get lost in. It's the getting lost part that keeps me coming back. For me, it's an escape from the constant barrage of life, work, social media, just that gnawing sense of always being connected. In the Ozarks, I become nobody. It's perfect. I parked my RV in a spot beside a winding gravel road. This secluded corner always seems to go untouched, which fits my style. On this first day, after setting up camp, I hit the hiking trails. Found this lovely old path twisting alongside a river, so serene. Didn't see another soul out there the whole day. Got back to camp just before nightfall, cooked dinner over the fire, and crashed out early. Honestly, a pretty ordinary day. The type you crave when you've had too much of the real world. That first night, something just felt... off. There were strange noises coming from deeper in the woods. Mostly rustling, branches snapping. Stuff you expect to hear out there but my gut gave a twinge. It was persistent, this unease. But being overly cautious? I mean, come on. I wrote it off as the wind picking up and decided to turn in. Maybe tomorrow I'd explore and see if anything had been around my campsite. Next morning, I took that planned scouting mission. Nothing. No tracks or signs of any large animals. So, what was my deal the night before? Paranoia? I shrugged it off and decided to enjoy my coffee by the campfire. I settled with a mug and listened to the morning songs of birds. I'd only have another few days of this serenity before facing the grind again. That's when I saw it. This... thing. A flash of movement way off in the trees. First thought. A big old buck. We weren't in deer season, but these woods... There are all sorts of critters I rarely see back home. Curiosity peaked. I slowly stepped in that direction. It appeared again, then ducked deeper into the forest. At this point, I know this wasn't normal behavior, definitely not deer-like. But again, Ozarks, who knows what lurks here? This nagging feeling told me to walk away, back to camp, lock myself in that RV until it was time to leave. But you see, I'm a stubborn guy. My name's Elkin, by the way. Elkin Wilder. The sensible part of me screamed for retreat, but I'm always up for a challenge. What was the worst that could happen? That thought alone should have stopped me. Instead, I went deeper. I followed, trying to be stealthy. Branches whipped against my face, twigs cracked under my boots. Then it reappeared, but closer this time. It moved hunched over, almost ape-like but also distinctly human. It vanished as quickly as it came, just a brief glimpse. Something wasn't right. Now there was fear. My breath quickened. Despite the warning bells, I followed. Dumb, right? It wasn't curiosity anymore, but this compulsive need to know. Like I had to unravel this. Whatever it was... This couldn't be natural. The Ozarks might be wild, but they weren't a zoo. And that shape, so strange, so out of place. This went on for a while, this game of cat and mouse. 
My heart pounded a frantic drumbeat, but the determination remained. Every glimpse showed. Well, not much. I'd only get a hint of movement like it was deliberately obscuring itself from full view. Now, let me describe this thing the best I can. First off, it was big. Tall and wide. Way bigger than an average man. The way it moved, it had this unsettling fluidity, but rigid too. Almost like it was constantly twitching, adjusting. That shape I first saw, low and crouched, seemed its default. Each time that feeling of wrongness would sink in even deeper. Not just fear, but an unease like my primal instinct screamed for safety. I'd almost give up, then there it'd be again, just beyond the trees. Luring me in? I kept thinking I'd get an answer. Find out what the hell was going on. I pushed further and further until that gravel road and my RV were only a distant memory. Then, finally, something I hadn't prepared for. An old trapper's cabin nestled within a clearing. Not that run-down cabin you see in movies. This one looked rough, but lived in. Something told me I wouldn't find friendly neighbors to ask for directions. But the movement, that thing, had disappeared. My legs trembled, not sure if it was exhaustion or terror. This cabin. Could there be a connection? Had that figure led me here? Was I losing my mind? That's when it hit me. The smells. God, it was foul. Rotting meat, but also something chemical underneath. My stomach lurched. There was that feeling again. An overwhelming sensation of wrong coming from inside that cabin. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. Yet, despite it all, an almost perverse desire pulled me closer. I had to see. Had to know. This compulsion battled with every screaming instinct to bolt the opposite way. Mistake. That was the turning point. Because what started as just wrong turned into horrifying. I'm going to spare you the gory details, but what lurked in that cabin was beyond what most folks could even fathom. This ain't a ghost story, no sir. This was raw, visceral evil. It was the figure, standing stock still just within the doorway, bathed in shadow. But something had changed. There were others, twisted, misshapen. I can't even call them human anymore. These things shifted and jerked, yet stayed strangely rigid. Each one different, twisted in a unique way, yet sharing this uncanny sameness that froze my blood. And all of them were staring right at me. Then it finally looked. The head of the first figure snapped toward me. There was nothing there where a face should have been. Nothing I could even describe. No way to make sense of it. It let out this... This keening screech like rusty nails ripping apart metal I lost it everything after that is a blur of scrambling feet and piercing screams mine I'm sure those figures were moving scrambling not gracefully like before but in a jarring jerky way I never knew how fast I could run branches slashed at my arms mud swallowed my boots it wasn't enough that guttural moan grew louder, echoing against the trees. One thing burned through my panic. They were chasing me. The only goal was escape. No destination, just get away. Each ragged gas burned my lungs. My legs threatened to give out. It wasn't that they were particularly fast. The figures, they staggered in this lurching gait. There was something wrong with the way they moved, yet that didn't make them slow. I remember stumbling onto the gravel road, tears blinding me. My RV. If I could reach it just a few more yards, maybe I'd have a chance. But that damned keening wail filled my ears. They were closing in. I risked a glance back. They hadn't stopped, hadn't slowed. That same unnatural rigidity seemed to propel them forward. In that panicked, split second, my foot caught a hidden root. I sprawled hard onto the rough gravel, hands scraping raw. Just before the darkness claimed me, I managed to snatch a final glance. And all those twisted figures were at the edge of the tree line, watching. 
that stillness again, their unnatural shapes stark against the foliage. It felt intentional, predatory. They didn't even attempt to attack as I lay there. Something held them back. I don't know how long I was out. Came to dazed, the sun starting its descent. Pain bloomed across my entire body, and when I tried to stand, a wave of nausea swept over me. Broken ankle, probably. And there they were, back in the same position, unmoving. It was as if they never blinked, those empty spaces where faces should be fixated on my position. Night fell, an agonizing stretch of time where survival hinged on pure desperation. It didn't look like they could or would cross out from under the trees. I realized if I crawled, crawled painfully on my belly, toward my RV, the line of sight could break momentarily. It was a sliver of hope, insane as it sounded. And as the sliver remained stubbornly unbroken, I began to believe. They couldn't follow if they couldn't see me. Maybe in those shadows, beneath those trees, something else held them back. With every agonizing twist of my body, that damned moaning chorus never changed in volume. Yet, the camper drew closer. Closer. Until finally, my outstretched fingers scraped the metal door handle. Somehow in my fumbling, the door opened. I hauled myself inside, slamming and locking it behind me with barely a second to spare. Even within the safety of the camper, the moaning reverberated. That's when I heard it. Clawing. Scratching. It was all over the camper's thin sheet metal. Something pounded frantically against the windows. But with dawn, even the scratching finally ceased. Silence. I didn't move. Didn't check until long after the sun was back in the sky. Finally, my shaking hands grasped the steering wheel. My fractured ankle pulsed in protest, but gritting my teeth, I slammed the RV into gear. I barely dared look in the rearview mirror as I left that gravel road behind. Those woods might hold countless unseen horrors, but those figures never chased me again. Years have passed. Still, on particularly silent nights, when the wind whispers through the trees just so, I swear, swear I can hear that low, eerie moaning, that unnatural call. Every time it sends a prickle of ice down my spine, they never caught me. I got lucky. Maybe others haven't. All I know is that whatever dwells in those Ozark woods, it isn't what you'd expect. It's worse. They say ignorance is bliss. Sometimes curiosity bears a terrible price. I still try to forget the unnatural way they moved, the hollow spaces where their faces should be. It'll haunt me as long as I live. It was an odyssey into the depths of pure fright an experience that redefined the very notion of terror. For within those shadowy woods, in that isolated realm, the human capacity for unimaginable evil took form. Some monsters lurk in the whispers of legends, others exist in the harsh light of day. I faced the latter, and it forever changed me. My yearly camping trips never went beyond the local campgrounds after that. I have no explanation for those creatures, not one that makes any sort of rational sense. Were they failed experiments? Some dark cults, victims? Who knows? But in those moments I felt hunted. Not just stalked, but watched meticulously, like a specimen. It gnaws at me to this day. Did that thing, the first one, deliberately draw me deeper, lead me to the cabin? I reported what I saw. Of course, the police thought I was crazy. I spun some tale of a drug-fueled hallucination, but they didn't fully buy it. The look in their eyes said enough. Maybe a few searched out there deep in the woods. Did they ever find that old cabin? If so, they kept it well hidden. There's no article, no missing person report, nothing that might explain it all. The official silence tells its own story. Either that, or the figures dealt with anyone who got too close to the truth. This might be my last chance to share this story. 
They say I have cancer. It's spread pretty badly. Maybe this is a kind of confession before I go quietly. Or maybe someone with the means, the drive, will read this and decide for themselves. Just remember, sometimes it's better to leave certain mysteries untouched. To walk away while you still can. It happened a few months ago, when I was traveling in the countryside. I'd always been a bit of an urbanite and loved the comfort of busy cities, but a friend convinced me that I needed a change of pace to face the unexpected. Rusty, you're too cramped up in those buildings. This trip will do you good. Little did I know how life-changing this decision would turn out to be. I reached the quaint town of Whitmore, Idaho, and checked into a small bed and breakfast run by an elderly couple named Rupert and Mary Hawthorne. After they welcomed me with warm smiles and hot tea, they directed me to my room with assurances that their small establishment would serve all my needs. The first few days were as pleasant as expected. Lovely walks down country lanes under a cloudless sky and life seemed to be on track. One breezy evening as I made my way back from an unusually long stroll through the nearby woods, I stumbled upon a seemingly abandoned house. Dilapidated and covered in ivy, its windows were shattered and the front door was creaking slightly in the wind. Curiosity peaked. I approached it cautiously but hesitated to enter. Just then, a hushed yet frantic conversation between two children drew my attention. I cautiously peeked around the side of the house and found what appeared to be siblings engaged in this secretive conversation. They both had unusually black eyes that seemed almost unnatural. Convinced that they were probably lost or abandoned themselves, I made my presence known. Hey there, I mustered up a friendly voice while trying hard not to show my concern for their eerie appearances. Are you guys okay? You seem lost or maybe scared about something. They turned towards me as one entity and stared directly into my eyes without uttering a word. At that very moment, an uneasy sensation crept through me, and I began to weigh the consequences of my decision to engage. As unnerving as it seemed, I couldn't walk away and leave these kids without help. With a faintly dry smile, I tried again. You know, perhaps we all could go back into town and figure out a way to reconnect with your family, or just stay at the B&B where I'm staying until then. One of the children broke their silence surprisingly abruptly. Oh, we're perfectly aware of that place, they uttered in unison, eliciting an involuntary shudder through me. Their calmly sinister tone seemingly bounced off my confusion. For a second there, I contemplated jogging away and pretending not to have seen them. But since the helpless get-out-of-jail tactic refused to surface, I stupidly asked anyway, So, do you want to come with me or do you need anything? Maybe a bag of chips or any food? Seeing no harm in such an offer, or maybe wrongly assuming it as a compromise, they immediately nodded in agreement. We headed towards the B&B &B together. They remained eerily silent, with the exception of some scarcely audible whispers between them. Upon arriving at the bed and breakfast, Rupert noticed our peculiar company and apprehensively gestured me toward him. Rusty, he said in an urgent undertone, are you aware that those children are... odd? They've been sighted lingering around on several occasions. Folks here believe they carry bad tidings. Before I could reply or attempt an explanation regarding my weird entourage for the night, they appeared behind us. Shadows cast across their unnaturally dark eyes created an indescribable aura that exuded heaviness and dread. We negotiated a deal food for answers, I responded hesitantly, while assuring myself this wasn't any big deal. Rupert reluctantly gave them some food, and we sat down by the fireplace to eat. An awkward silence filled the room, my mind racing in logic circles to untangle this bizarre encounter. As I opened my mouth to address them, suddenly a piercing scream resonated through the inn, setting our hairs on end. The children's eyes glinted with malice as they began laughing hysterically. Oily black darkness seemed to pour out of them, and obsidian tendrils twisted and spread through the air, 
Every instinct screamed for me to run, but my body was paralyzed with fear. The darkness enveloped us as the menacing laughter echoed relentlessly, building in intensity. As the oily black darkness continued to spread, a cacophony of screams echoed throughout the inn. I desperately tried to call out for help, but my voice was drowned out by the sinister laughter. Rupert, petrified by the horror unfolding before him, fumbled with his phone, attempting to dial for help. As the children menacingly approached us, the tendrils of darkness inched closer and assaulted every person in the room. People writhed and wailed as they struggled against the oppressive force that seemed intent on causing immeasurable suffering. The innkeeper's wife, Susan, rushed in from another room only to be immediately seized by the tendrils. She screamed in agony as they wrapped around her body, constricting her like a vice. Everywhere people were being hurt, tortured by an ungodly frenzy of malice. Suddenly, Rupert pressed his phone against his ear, eyes wide with hope. Please send help. We don't know what's happening here. Something, something terrible is happening. He gave their location to whoever he'd been able to reach on the other end of the line. The black-eyed children turned their focus toward Rupert, their features distorted into a vicious snarl in response to his attempt for help. They stormed toward him and tore the phone from his hand before crushing it underneath their feet. Susan's sobs were muffled as darkness enveloped her completely. We could no longer see her. The other guests suffered similar fates, each one consumed and silenced as this despicable scene unfolded relentlessly. I tried again to call out for help but only managed a feeble choke. No one seemed able to resist or escape this living nightmare. The children showed no signs of stopping whatever twisted purpose they had set upon us all. In a horrifying twist, the darkness receded slightly, revealing Susan's now lifeless body sprawled on the floor, her eyes wide with terror. Panic surged through those still alive as the reality of the children's power dawned on everyone. They were murdering us one by one. The air was soon filled with pleading and begging, desperate prayers from the victims to be spared this fate. But throughout the chaos, the children remained stoic and unrelenting. One after another, friends and strangers alike fell victim to the inky tendrils. I watched in abject horror as lives were snuffed out around me, unable to help or flee. Hours, or was it days, passed in this cyclic torment. The lucky ones passed quickly. Others were subjected to prolonged suffering before finally succumbing. A heavy hopelessness weighed me down as I awaited my turn with death. At last, surrounded by the dead and dying, I was alone with the black-eyed children. They stood before me, their eyes alight with malice. Suddenly, the room flooded with light as sirens echoed in the distance. The door burst open just as an arm of darkness reached out for me. First responders spilled into the room but stopped dead at the gruesome sight. The darkness and black-eyed children vanished without a trace, leaving only devastation in their wake. For weeks after that horrifying event, investigators combed through the remains of that night. They could neither explain nor rationalize what had occurred there. No answers were found for our suffering. I survived that hellish nightmare, but will bear these scars, physical and emotional, for eternity. Those lost in that twisted game haunt my memories every waking moment. The community forever changed as families mourned and tried to pick up pieces of shattered lives. I know one thing for certain. This world is not always what it seems. Somewhere in its depths lie evil forces that thirst for human agony and despair. And sometimes, those forces take on a seemingly innocent form like black-eyed children. It was the sort of mechanical hum that makes you think your ears are playing tricks on you. A constant, low-frequency vibration that seemed to be coming from the very earth beneath my feet. Working for the U.S. government on secret genetic experiments at a secluded facility deep in the forests of Northern California had its fair share of odd moments. But this was different. 
My name's Remo Barone, a lab tech by trade and an inadvertent sleuth by circumstance. That morning, we were introduced to Lev Grossman, our new head of security, an enigmatic figure with piercing blue eyes that scanned everything with meticulous skepticism. Lev's presence was commanding, and his lack of words matched only by his ability to convey everything with just a look. Most of us found it unnerving, especially Jared Manko, our lead researcher who never missed a chance to break the ice with a joke. If looks could kill, we'd need a new security head every week. Developments at the lab were always on a need-to-know basis, which meant we rarely knew anything until it was directly in front of us under a microscope. But that sound... It didn't take long before Lev and I were searching the facility's perimeter, guns securely holstered at our hips. No amount of training could prepare us for what lay beyond the tree line. A trail of devastation cut through the woods, trees uprooted, earth gouged as if by massive claws... Lev signaled for silence as we moved closer to investigate one particularly large crevice. Throwing in a glow stick revealed something horrifying. Remnants of what appeared to be tissue samples intermingled with metallic fragments. What kind of experiment could do this? Lev whispered, more to himself than to me. We heard rustling, sudden and close. Weapon in hand, Lev motioned me backward when out from shadow emerged Dr. Sheila Kavinsky, her lab coat marred with grime and blood streaks. She was visibly shaken, but managed to spit out her encounter before collapsing. Its skin, like an old folktale, not human. The facility blared into lockdown mode immediately after we stumbled back inside with Sheila. As per protocol during breaches, no outside help could be called. Containment and secrecy were paramount above all else. As night fell over the forest canopy like a shroud, Jared joked uneasily while bandaging Sheila's wounds. Guess even Mother Nature doesn't want us messing around in her backyard. The attempt at humor did little to cut through the growing tension. Scouring over video surveillance yielded no images beyond an amorphous blur that seemed both part of the forest and yet foreign to it. A creature from local folklore, perhaps? A being that should not exist per natural law yet left behind tangible carnage? Weapon drawn once more, I roamed the now dimly lit corridors towards where the creature had last been seen on camera. Every shadow seemed animated by some unseen force. Every slight creak from metal heating or cooling now signified potential movement. Just then, control room alarms blared reporting multiple breaches along various sections of the compound's infrastructure. The unknown assailant wasn't acting randomly. Its movements were strategic, intelligent. Jared radioed through panicking breaths while barricading himself within Research Lab 3. Remo, it's going through walls as if they're paper, like it knows exactly where... The radio cut off abruptly mid-sentence, followed by deafening silence as if all life itself had been sucked out from around me. I froze. The silence after Jared's last words hung thick in the air. I resisted the urge to call out for him. It would reveal my position. Instead, I backed slowly toward the nearest exit, keeping my eyes peeled for any sign of movement. A sudden commotion outside drew my attention. Screams from my colleagues mixed with a sound that resembled ripping metal. I edged towards a window and risked a glance. A large figure moved with unnatural swiftness, tearing apart barriers as though they were made of cloth. It stood at least eight feet tall. Its skin appeared to be a mix of rough textures similar to bark and stone. Muscle rippled beneath the surface as it moved, each limb ending in what could only be described as claws, sharp and efficient. Radio static brought me back to focus. I pressed the talk button. Evacuate immediately. No code for this scenario existed. Improvisation was all that was left. In a blend of planning and instinct, I sprinted to Lab 4. There might be a flare gun there. Upon entry, I noticed Marie lying motionless by her desk. Her body mangled in a way that no fall or accident could cause confirming she wouldn't need the flare gun anymore. 
Without hesitation, I grabbed the gun and dashed out of the lab toward the southern emergency exit, away from where that creature was last seen. Outside, under the scant moonlight, I let off several bright red flares into the sky. It was all I could do as a signal for help outside of our compromised communication system. Then I ran into the woods in the hopes of finding shelter until rescue arrived. After hours spent hidden within an abandoned ranger station, dawn approached and with it came the sound of helicopters and shouted commands through megaphones. An extraction team found me just as daylight began to repel the night's shadows. They asked about survivors or what had happened, but I could only shake my head. In debriefing, they mentioned finding just one body, Marie's, confirming no others remained at the compound. Now safe at a temporary facility, people in suits asked questions about security footage and creature behavior, but all remained speculation without solid evidence or understanding. Church bells from nearby towns rang for those lost unsung heroes, while we survivors nursed our grief silently, offering respect to their memories without words. The story ended not with comprehension, but with acknowledgement. Something unknown had crossed paths with us, leaving behind chaos and prompting endless questions about what lurks unseen alongside us on this planet we thought we knew so well. October 10th, 2012. It started with a job. Figured it'd be an easy in and out. Mapping some old logging trails up in the Washington Cascades for a timber company. Get paid, spend a few weeks in the woods. Sounded perfect to me. Name's Cole, by the way. Ex-Army. Did some wilderness training stuff after. Living off-grid ain't a hobby for me. It's a skill set. Landed myself a sweet little campsite by a creek. Real secluded. First few days went smooth. Work was straightforward. The woods were the usual thick, rain-soaked Pacific Northwest tangle. Nights were quiet, except for the normal critter noises. But by the end of that first week, things started feeling... off. Wasn't anything obvious. More a prickling at the back of my neck. That gut instinct you get after too many patrols in bad territory. Then I found the elk. It was half submerged in the creek, not more than a hundred yards from my camp. Hide stripped clean off, the meat carved away like it had been butchered. Didn't see any tracks that made sense, not with the way the carcass was torn up. Figured maybe a cougar got lucky, dragged its kill somewhere safer. Still, I slept with my rifle close that night. Couple days later I was way off trail, marking a stand of old growth the company wanted surveyed. Found myself in a small clearing where something big had gone through. Branches snapped high up, the ground churned to mud. And there, in the prints, were these massive clawed footprints, definitely no bear or anything I recognized. The thing that made them was strong, heavy. I started backtracking, following the trail of destruction. That's when I heard it, the crack of a branch snapping, just ahead in the trees. I froze, rifle raised, but there was nothing to see in the thick undergrowth. The forest fell silent. Then, from somewhere behind me, came a low snarl that turned my blood cold. I turned, scanning the trees. That's when I saw it, crouched on a moss-covered boulder. Huge, looked like a mix of man and wolf, but twisted and wrong. Its skin was stretched tight over bone, almost translucent. Its eyes burned yellow in the dim light. We stared at each other, maybe ten seconds that felt like forever. My finger found the rifle's trigger, but something held me back. It wasn't just animal instinct, it was deeper. A primal dread that screamed at me, this ain't natural. The creature lunged, and I fired on instinct. I remember the roar of my rifle, the bark shattering from trees. The creature jerked, then vanished into the undergrowth. I stumbled back, breathing ragged, heart pounding like a drum solo. Didn't stop to think, just emptied the rifle in the direction I thought it had gone with a desperate yell. 
I knew then it wasn't over. Whatever that thing was, I'd pissed it off. Back at my camp, I packed up everything I could carry and booked it out of there. Didn't stop running until I found a road, flagged down a trucker who gave me a wide-eyed look but drove me to the nearest town. Called the job in sick, told the timber company to forget about me mapping those woods. Figured they'd write me off as some nature kook. Didn't care. Never went back to the Cascades. That snarl echoes in my head sometimes, especially at night. Folks say Bigfoot's a myth, an old wives' tale to scare kids. I saw something out there, something that ain't in any guidebook. And in those woods, deeper than maps show and darker than men go, I reckon the locals have a name for it. The Wendigo. Let me tell you, the aftermath wasn't pretty. Couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, jumped at every shadow. Nightmares plagued me. The creature's blazing eyes, the hunger in its snarl. Tried to tell people, but they looked at me like I was crazy. Drank myself stupid for a while, trying to erase the memory. Didn't work. Eventually, I picked myself up. Drifted from place to place. Never stay anywhere too long. Keep a rifle loaded. Sleep with one eye open. I ain't the same guy who headed into those woods. Maybe that cold died back there in the clearing. Maybe the thing in the trees took a piece of me. But here's the thing about monsters. Once you know they're real, you can never go back to pretending they're not. Word gets around, even in the off-grid crowd. Met a guy in Montana last year a Lakota elder at an off-season powwow, heard my story and just nodded, told me there are things in the deep places, old things with names only whispered around dying fires. We traded tobacco, shared a flask under the stars. He said, You saw a walker between worlds. Best you run and don't look back. Guess I'm still running. My name is Eric Townsend, and this happened to me in August of 2008. Back then, I was the epitome of the straight-laced government agent, suit and tie, shiny shoes, and a mind full of classified protocols. Now? Well, let's just say the suit doesn't fit anymore, and the shine's long gone off the world. They sent me to investigate a cluster of disappearances on the outskirts of Phoenix, Arizona. Hikers, campers, even a few homeless folks drawn to the desert edge vanished without a trace. Locals muttered about cartel violence, but there was a wrongness to the whole pattern. Too clean, too thorough. I figured it was something more organized. A cult, maybe. The Bureau has a file on every flavor of lunatic, after all. My partner was Agent Garcia, seasoned, cynical, the kind of guy who'd seen too much darkness to be rattled anymore. We went undercover, jeans and hiking boots instead of crisp suits. Spent our days poking around the desert fringes, interviewing jittery witnesses, trying to piece together some thread of logic. A local ranger tipped us off about a system of caves out east of the city, rumored to be used for drug smuggling. Figured it was worth a look. A cult or cartel might hole up in a place like that. We went out under cover of darkness. The desert air was crisp, filled with a strange hum that set my teeth on edge. Cicadas, maybe, but too rhythmic. Flashlights cut through the gloom as we approached the cave mouth. The smell hit us first, metallic and sweet, like overripe fruit and old blood mixed together. Garcia swore under his breath, hand drifting to his sidearm. We edged cautiously into the darkness. The interior was surprisingly smooth, like the walls had been melted or carved, not formed naturally. Our flashlights picked up glistening trails on the ground, a viscous, iridescent slime. Then we found the source. Bones, half dissolved, stripped of flesh, littered the cavern floor. They were segmented, insectile, like nothing I'd ever seen, and the size of them, it implied a creature straight out of a nightmare. Let's get the hell out of here, I hissed. There was too much bad history in those bones, too clear a sign that whatever lurked here wasn't human. We were halfway to the cave mouth when Garcia tripped. His flashlight went skittering, 
tumbling end over end into the blackness. Before we could react, the hum changed pitch, rising to a whine that drilled into my skull. The creature erupted from the darkness, a blur of chitinous plates and writhing limbs. It was far bigger than the bones suggested, the size of a small car. The head. It was a writhing mass of segmented eyes and dripping mandibles. It let loose a shriek somewhere between a buzzsaw and a howl that set off every alarm bell in my body. Garcia, bless him, didn't freeze. He opened fire, the gunshots deafening in the enclosed space. The rounds pinged off the thing's armor, barely slowing it down. It lunged for him, one segmented leg scything through the air. Garcia leapt aside, rolled with the impact, but not fast enough. The claw sliced his leg open, a spray of crimson across the rock. He screamed, more in rage than pain. Run! he roared at me. Don't look back, just run! I didn't need telling twice. I scrambled for the cave mouth, the creature's roar echoing behind me. Halfway out, I risked a glance back. Garcia had his back to a wall, emptying his pistol into the oncoming monstrous form. But the creature was too fast, too strong. I saw the claw sweep down, saw Garcia's body lifted, then the wet crunch as he was... I turned away, bile rising in my throat and bolted out into the desert night. I ran until my lungs burned, until I collapsed, gasping on the sandy ground. The creature didn't follow. Maybe the gunshot spooked it. Maybe it preferred dark spaces. It didn't matter. I was alive. Garcia was... Garcia was dead, fulfilling that most dreaded of agent duties, sacrificial pawn to buy time. I got up shakily, stumbled my way back to civilization. The aftermath is the usual bureaucratic mess. The Bureau sanitized the incident, covering up Garcia's death as a freak hiking accident. I know better. They offered me a desk job, compensation for my ordeal. I took it, though a part of me rebelled against the safety. My apartment has the blinds drawn 24-7, and I jump at every creak in the floorboards. That hum, the insectile whine, lingers in my dreams, and with it the image of Garcia's shattered body. People tell me I'm lucky to be alive. I guess. But some days out here in the gray anonymity of my new life, I feel more trapped than ever, just waiting for the darkness to seep up through the cracks because that creature is still out there. Somewhere in the depths of those desert caves, it lives, it grows, breeding maybe, creating more of its monstrous kind. And the next time someone ventures too close, the next time some curious hiker or hapless soul stumbles on its lair, there won't be anyone like Garcia to save them. This happened to me a few years back. Back then, solo road trips were my escape. Folks think that sounds lonely, but for this city planner with too much traffic and not enough quiet, the open road felt like freedom. My name is Harlan, by the way. My folks always insisted on unique monikers for their brood. My chosen destination this time was Utah. Red canyons. A real contrast to the gray, urban sprawl I endured back home. I'd stocked up my RV with all the usual gear. Sleeping bag, hiking boots, maps, plenty of granola bars. What I hadn't prepared for was what stumbled onto my path deep in Zion National Park. Don't get me wrong, I'd done the popular trails. You know the type, ones filled with selfie-taking crowds and kids in matching shirts. Thing is, the more remote stretches held more allure. There was a marked path called Kolob Narrows I'd read about on some outdoor adventure blog. They boasted about stunning slot canyons, towering rock formations, the works. And according to reviews, it was guaranteed to be less crowded due to the challenge factor. That sounded more my speed. So, bright and early one morning, I packed a lightweight day pack and got myself to the trailhead. Now nature isn't my whole identity like those survivalist types but I have common sense. 
A compass was on me. Plenty of water, all packed with my usual attention to detail. There weren't too many folks starting out at my hour. A bonus indeed. The first couple of miles were gorgeous. Sandstone formations that felt otherworldly. Streams with water so clear you could see fish darting about. The trail followed the river at times, making for a bit of rock hopping, but nothing overly intense. However, as the day wore on, I noticed a shift. The crowds had vanished, the path narrowed, and I'd swear the rock faces enclosed with every step. No cell signal, of course, something I should have anticipated. Yet, there was this pull forwards, the thought of whatever waited out there, maybe some jaw-dropping rock formation, something most tourists never witness. Stupid in hindsight, maybe, but it didn't feel that way in the moment. It must have been mid-afternoon when I reached a part of the trail that bordered a particularly treacherous stretch of river. This wasn't kiddie pool level. We're talking rapids, maybe ten yards across between canyon walls that stretched so high they blocked out the sky itself. It felt like some ancient gate barring progress, and at that very moment, it dawned on me. I hadn't spotted another human the entire afternoon. I wasn't about to take some ridiculous risk and ford that water alone. It would mean turning back, admitting a bit of defeat, maybe. But that's the sensible course of action, right? Still, it rankled. Something in me stubbornly yearned to continue. But even as I contemplated my choices, an eerie silence descended. No bird calls, not even a cricket's chirp. It sent shivers down my spine. Then... As I pivoted back, I froze. Maybe twenty feet away, obscured in the shadow of a massive boulder, stood a figure. A man-shaped figure, at least. All I could register was an impression of size. Large. Larger than anyone I'd ever met, and his form seemed distorted by the rock's jagged outline. My instincts screamed for a clear look to assess my situation. Yet, as my eyes refocused, I stumbled back with a shocked shout. This person held something slick and crimson in his hand. Something not animal. In my gut, I knew that was blood. My shout didn't startle him. There was this casual turn of the head, like a hawk regarding some tiny critter scuttling past. Our eyes met. Or did they? I couldn't quite tell from behind his ragged hair and tangled beard. There was just emptiness in that look. Then, as easily as he appeared, he slipped back behind his shadowed perch, vanishing from sight. Logic, rationality, all that disappeared. Suddenly, that treacherous river seemed far less terrifying than the shadowy form who stalked it. Fear turned my muscles to ice, then pushed me into motion. Every rock scramble back through the narrowing canyon felt like an escape out of the clutches of death itself. There was no sense of distance or time, just blind need to flee. I reached the RV near exhaustion, stumbling over my own words at the park ranger station as I gasped out something garbled about an attack. Some madman in the woods. Later, there was the search party. There were cops asking endless questions and that gnawing uncertainty about whether they believed me. Maybe they thought I'd hallucinated from heat exhaustion, which wouldn't be an unreasonable conclusion based on how I appeared. Of course, they found nothing. No tracks. No sign of that shadowy predator. The cops seemed resigned. The rangers offered those patronizing reassurances about getting lost in the park's size. And the worst part... The suspicion I started to have about, well, whatever those crimson, sticky pieces had been, I saw clutched in the hand of that haunting figure. There went my hiking. It wasn't some dramatic conversion to city life I had, more like a gradual shift. You get out on some trail now, see people start vanishing around a bend, and that deep primal fear takes root. Then I imagine those eyes, vacant and predatory, peeking out from behind some overgrown scrub. And even if common sense says that's improbable, fear doesn't work with logic. So now my open roads lead towards more populated destinations, 
and my maps stay close to the interstates, where signs of civilization abound. Less adventurous than what I craved before, maybe. But I swear sometimes you hear stories on the news about disappearances in isolated regions, missing hikers whose cases just sort of trail off without answers. And all I can see, when I hear them, is that figure lurking in the shadows. Maybe my brush with darkness in that Utah canyon is the closest I'll ever come to knowing what true evil looks like. Frankly, it's an experience I could have lived a full, happy life without. This happened to me a few years back. Makes me chuckle now, not because of what happened, that still sends shivers down my spine, but because of what a skeptical idiot I was before it. See, I've always prided myself on being practical, down to earth, someone who isn't swayed by ghost stories and creepy campfire tales. Funny how life knocks that arrogance right out of you. My name's Derek, by the way, mid-thirties, outdoorsy-ish, more a hiking enthusiast than a full-blown survivalist. Back then, I was into this kick of trying RV life after seeing all those folks gushing about it online. Figured it would be a neat way to work remotely and see some different national parks. So, there I was, driving along a scenic state highway in Arizona. Can't say the exact place. Wouldn't want you folks running off getting yourselves into the same mess I did. It was beautiful country, though. Those red rock formations rising out of the desert. The whole Wild West vibe. I'd found a quiet little pull-off with stunning views, just me in the wilderness. Paradise, as far as I was concerned. That first evening, nothing weird. I cracked open a beer, grilled some dinner, relaxed at the little RV's table. You know those travel brochures that go on about endless starry nights? I was living that cliché, and loving every damn second. I stayed up late, staring out, letting the silence and solitude settle over me. This kind of peace, you only get it way out from civilization. Maybe that's the first mistake I made, believing I was truly alone. Next morning, I woke up, made coffee, the whole cozy RV routine. I decided to do a short hike before getting down to work. There was a trail winding up from the highway, and the view promised to be even better than from the campground. Off I set, feeling adventurous, my backpack light. About half a mile up, things took a bizarre turn. There it was, smack in the middle of the path, a pile of coyote bones. Now, animals die. It's nature. But this, it was meticulously arranged. Ribs all lined up, the skull staring off down the trail like a little skeletal guardian. No bite marks, no sign of a struggle. It looked like they had just collapsed into this perfect creepy display. My city slicker mind balked. Maybe some weird kid did this, I mumbled to myself, poking it with my hiking stick. That felt off. I was in the wilderness, middle of nowhere, and someone's bored child is out here building horror movie props? Didn't add up, but determined not to let this ruin my hike, I pushed it out of mind and moved on. Hours later, back at the RV, I still couldn't shake it. Every crack of a twig, every rustle had me on edge. Was someone watching me? It was stupid, that primal sense of unease, but it wouldn't let go. That night, sleep was restless. Every shadow danced with menace, every whisper of wind carried some imagined threat. And I started hearing something else. Faint, distant scratching. Coming from outside. I froze. It sounded like nails on the RV door. Just as the sound was fading, I gathered the courage to peek out a window. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nerves getting the better of you, Derek. I snorted at myself, but the adrenaline wouldn't go away. It wasn't like there were bears this far south, but you hear horror stories. People alone in the woods, never being seen again. What if this was it? This quiet spot would be the perfect place to get rid of some nosy RVer, 
and no one would have a clue until my rig got found years later. By morning, I was laughing at myself. Of course, there wasn't anyone waiting to eat me. Had to be wined on the branches. Whatever. Yet something had changed. Every noise set me on high alert. I was no longer out for a relaxing getaway. I was in survival mode. That instinct probably saved my life. I was at my local bar, finishing up my second whiskey sour. A line of empty glasses sat in front of me, knocking on my wallet's door. Normally, I'd have stopped after the first one, but October had been an exhausting ordeal, and I decided to welcome November with open arms and a little buzz. It was a Tuesday that felt eerily calm. Not your typical Tuesday calm. There was something about the atmosphere that unsettled me but I brushed it off as post-Halloween jitters. The air was crisp, with a biting chill that whispered secrets of oncoming snow, and darkness enveloped the small town earlier than usual. Charlie, my best friend since first grade and I were deep in conversation, when our attention was drawn to the sudden noise outside. There was a crash, followed by incomprehensible yelling that provoked startled bar patrons. What's going on out there? Charlie asked with worried astonishment while peering through the window. We should probably stay in here, man, I suggested tentatively. No point risking our safety if it turns out to be dangerous. Charlie reluctantly agreed as we turned back to face the bar. My head snapped up as three children slowly walked into the dimly lit room. Their unnaturally pallid complexions seemed to shimmer under the flickering lights. Their eyes were black voids so dark they seemed to absorb all the light in their vicinity. The room grew colder upon their arrival, and conversation dwindled as unease took its place. One thing I immediately noticed about them, aside from their eyes, of course, was the way they moved, deliberately detached from anything that conveyed humanness or warmth. They almost seemed mechanical in every step they took. The bartender nervously approached them with an unconvincing smile plastered on his face. Hi there. Um, can I help you? In unison, the disturbing children tilted their heads to the left much like a rag doll whose headstrings were jerked. Their voices were bone-chillingly otherworldly as they simultaneously mumbled in monotones. Our mother sent us. We're searching for lost souls. Well, nobody's lost here. Charlie spoke up abruptly, trying to inject some humor to lighten the palpably dense air. But some might be more soulless than others after a drink or two. His attempts fell flat as the children didn't even acknowledge his words. Suddenly, the jukebox I bumped into earlier sprang to life with a highly inappropriate tune about a grandmother getting hit by flying reindeer. The black-eyed children remained unfazed in their vat of pitch eyes, it was clear they had something on their agenda other than listening to our jokes or tasteless songs. As I turned back towards them, it was then that I felt a surge of adrenaline combined with dread. The kids were gone, vanished from sight like autumn leaves swept up by a gust of wind. Rapid, panicked whispers began to circulate within the bar. Where did they go? Are they dangerous? Their fearful inquiries led me and Charlie outside where we realized that everyone in town was now under siege by these freakishly similar children. Their numbers multiplied exponentially on every dark corner. A scream pierced the night as one of these mysterious creatures lunged at an unfortunate pedestrian who tried crossing their path. The man fell and writhed on the sidewalk, clawing at his eyes frantically as if to remove an unspeakable horror he saw within him. The whole town erupted into chaos, Shouts echoed through the streets as residents struggled to either fight off or flee from the menacing entities. Gone was my practiced skepticism over matters unexplained. Nothing could have prepared me for this supernatural invasion. As the town spiraled into chaos, I tried to process the nightmare unfolding before my eyes. These black-eyed children seemed to be everywhere, relentlessly pursuing the townspeople. 
People were running everywhere. Terrified screams filled the air, and the once peaceful town had become a battleground. I turned to Charlie, and we hesitated for a moment. We didn't know whether to fight these strange children or try to escape. My instincts told me that fighting was not an option. Something unnatural about them made me doubt our chances of survival if we confronted them head on. Escape seemed a more logical course of action. I think we should get out of here, I shouted to Charlie over the commotion. I agree, he replied, fear evident in his voice. But where do we go? This whole town is being overrun. Without wasting any more time, we decided to head towards the outskirts of town in hopes of finding some shelter from the attack. As we ran through the streets, dodging both panicked residents and menacing black-eyed children, I pulled out my phone and tried calling 911. To my dismay, all I received was an automated message stating that all lines were busy. Feeling helpless and unsure of what to do next, we continued running. The darkness was almost suffocating at this point, making it difficult for us to see where we were going. It felt like hours had passed since our escape from the bar. Our legs were heavy with exhaustion, but stopping was not an option. Finally, we spotted an old cabin on the edge of town with no signs of life inside or around it. Seeing no other option for shelter at that moment, we hastily approached it, despite our fear that the black-eyed children might already have claimed it as their territory. As we entered the cabin, tension filled every inch of our bodies as we quietly searched for potential threats. Thankfully, there was no one, or nothing, inside. We locked the door and barricaded it to be safe. Our breathing strained under the weight of our terror. We tried to come up with a plan. Unable to call for help, we felt trapped and vulnerable. We knew that staying in the cabin wasn't a long-term solution, but leaving would expose us to danger again. As time ticked on, it seemed like we would never find a way out of this horrifying situation. Suddenly, we heard pounding on the doors and windows. The black-eyed children had found us. Their voices were terrifyingly calm as they repeatedly asked us to let them in, saying they needed our help. We clung on to each other, refusing to comply. Then, as swiftly as it started, the pounding stopped. We heard distant screams echoing from the town center. Somehow, we understood that this was our chance to escape. Either because the black-eyed children had completed their goal, or something had happened to draw their attention elsewhere. Solemn and filled with grief for those who hadn't made it through the night, we slowly pushed away from each other. Grateful for our survival but weighed down by loss and confusion, we left the sanctuary of the cabin, hoping against hope that what awaited us outside was not another nightmare. As we entered the streets once more, there were no signs of the black-eyed children. Only broken windows and shattered glass remained as mute testimony to their assault on our town. Exhausted and traumatized beyond words, Charlie and I tried to process what had just happened. We eventually returned to our everyday lives with questions still unanswered. Where did these sinister beings come from? What did they want? More importantly, what happened now that they seemed to be gone? Though life in town slowly resumed its usual pace over time, some things could never be forgotten or brought back. Homes destroyed, loved ones lost that dreadful night and the boundaries of reality shattered by the appearance of those black-eyed children who had changed the course of our lives forever. You know that unsettling feeling you get when things are going just a bit too well? That was the sense tingling in the back of my mind as I arrived at the sprawling, hidden compound nestled deep within the dense Okfenoki Swamp in Georgia. As a geneticist working for a discreet wing of the U.S. government, my days often blurred into a series of experiments and reports that most people couldn't even begin to fathom. My name, Creedon Hollis, doesn't come up much outside of classified files and nondescript badges granting access to high-security areas. 
I spent my days splicing genes in search of medical breakthroughs. Or at least, that's what I was told to believe. Co-workers like Elspeth Rundle or Barnabas Keeble were smart cookies. We shared uneasy jokes about mutating into superhumans to cope with our morally gray work. We laughed, but nobody truly relaxed in a place like this. The lab was silent, except for the hum of equipment when I walked through the sterilized halls to reach my station. Just another day, or so it seemed, until I found an unexpected note on my desk. Check the West Wing containment area. Anomaly detected. Anomaly? We used such words for minor issues, not crises. Yet there was an urgency to this scribbled message. Passing through several security doors, I reached where we held our more volatile subjects. The air felt tighter here, heavier with unasked questions about what we were really doing, all under the guise of patriotism. Suddenly, without warning, the power went out. Emergency red lights flickered on as shouts pierced through the darkness from several corridors away. My heart raced, not out of fear, or so I told myself, but from conditioned alertness. In this soundless chaos, isolation gnawed at me with cold teeth, reminding me acutely that help was not an option here. Protocol demanded silence unless absolutely necessary. A bestial growl from deep within the containment cells washed over me with chilling certainty. An orchestrated event had begun unfolding. Gun at ready, provided to all personnel as reassurance. I moved towards the source cautiously and practically unnoticed, which was not particularly comforting. I found Elspeth hunched over a console, trying to restore full power. There's something loose. She spat out between keystrokes. No further explanation needed. We knew exactly what implications lurked within those words. The air suddenly grew thick with metallic stench as Barnabas staggered towards us from another corridor. His white lab coat splattered with an artist's palette of crimson and scarlet hues. His usual playful smirk was replaced by an expression wrought by sheer terror. We have to lock down the facility. He gasped his last words just before his body thudded onto the cold floor. A darker pool blossomed around him while we stood frozen in horror. Elspeth and I exchanged glances. Our unofficial code for this is really happening. With adrenaline as our silent partner, we scrambled through dimly lit rooms toward where containment once thrived, a now shredded semblance of security. As we advanced cautiously through debris-strewn hallways, Sounds of primal savagery echoed off walls that had once seemed impervious to nature's untamed wrath. This wasn't any predator known to man or beast. It was as if folklore had grafted itself onto reality, creating a chimera that defied logic, yet demanded belief through sheer force of presence. Elspeth briefly locked eyes with it, a glimpse enough to etch its visage into nightmare for life before firing rounds in desperate defiance against an opponent she couldn't begin to comprehend but knew well enough to fear. Elspeth's gun clicked empty. We turned and ran. The creature's roars filled the echoing corridors behind us. We reached a door marked Secure Calm Room and threw ourselves inside, slamming the heavy metal shut tight. I bolted it and turned to Elspeth, her face white with terror. We need help, she said, panting hard. I agreed and moved to the console. The line was dead. Our isolation was complete, location unknown to most, deemed unreachable for our own safety when dealing with what we termed outliers. But safety had become a phantom. Elspeth checked her weapon. We have to find another way out. We left the room silently, checking each corner with caution born from necessity rather than bravery. The sight of it appeared again at the end of the hallway, swift movement and a blur of dark fur edged with dripping wet crimson from its last encounter. It was large, easily twice the size of a bear, but moved with a predator's grace that no bear could match. It charged. Elspeth fired a flare toward it, not in hope of injury but distraction. 
For a moment its eyes reflected a brilliant red before it leapt away into the shadows outside our sight. We keep moving. I spoke now, trying to sound certain. As we navigated through the facility's labyrinth and lower levels, the systematic destruction was undeniable evidence of its wrath. We stumbled upon our co-worker James, or what remained of him, in Lab 3C, his eyes wide open in surprise more than fear. Elspeth turned away. Her throat worked as if she wanted to say something but thought better of it. We found an exit beneath fallen debris in what used to be storage. Daylight filtered in weakly from above providing just enough light for us to climb out from our technological tomb into fresh air that seemed foreign after hours below. As we hauled ourselves out into the woods surrounding our facility, we noticed an eerie silence. No bird song or rustle of small creatures in underbrush. It seemed they too had sensed or witnessed this new apex predator's dominance over their domain. After hours of walking and avoiding any sort of path that might circle back to our nightmarish origin, we stumbled onto a logging road and were ultimately found by confused but concerned loggers who contacted authorities after noticing our distress and serious injuries. Weeks later, they told me researchers concluded it could have been an undiscovered species, maybe pushed towards aggressive behavior by some external factors like disease or loss of habitat mere speculations for what we encountered that day. Survivor's guilt weighs heavily on me, but brings with it responsibility. To tell the tale so that others may learn from our unpreparedness against nature's darker surprises, and mourn those lost in naive arrogance that some facilities can contain what should never be caged. November 8th, 1991. Folks up here call me Hayes, Hayes Griffin. I've been working these mountains trapping and logging since I was old enough to hold an axe. I know the backwoods around the boundary waters like the back of my hand, or so I thought. Thing is, there are places out there where maps don't mean much, and a man's knowledge can turn against him. Pride can get you killed out here. This was back when I was trapping mostly beaver and muskrat. Had a line I ran deep in the woods, old cabins marking the spots to check. Wasn't a bad life, if a solitary one. One morning, mid-season, I was heading to the farthest cabin. The one folks said was haunted, but nobody I knew had ever seen proof. I figured it was drifters and moonshiners, using it on the sly so I kept extra alert should have listened to that prickling at the back of my neck. Wasn't long into the hike when I caught the smell. Now, I've dealt with gut piles, skunks, all the stink nature can throw at you. This was... wrong. Like something rotten, left in the sun too long, with a chemical sweetness underneath that made me want to puke. Figured it must be a dead deer somewhere off trail. Happens sometimes. Predator gets it, but doesn't finish the meal. Kept going, rifle gripped tight, the smell growing stronger. Then, I rounded a bend, and there it was, right in the middle of the path. The deer carcass, or what was left of it. Mangled, half the meat torn away, bones splintered. The fur around the wounds was blackened, like it had been burned. Didn't make sense. Coyote pack, maybe, if they were starving but even they don't leave a mess like this. I circled wide, eyes on the tree line. That's when I saw the tracks. I grew up finding sign, knew my deer from my bear, wolf from dog. These prints, they weren't right. Bigger than my boot, but with only four toes. Claws looked long, maybe three inches. And the gait, it was off kilter, not like any animal I knew. That's when it hit me. That god-awful stench from before. It was all around me, only stronger. I didn't stick around to investigate. Checked my trap line, but couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. Whatever left those tracks, it knew I was there. Back at the cabin that night, I heard it. A howl, longer and higher-pitched than a wolf's. It echoed off the hillsides, 
making it seem like the sound was coming from every direction at once. Then came something else, something worse, a high-pitched screech, like a woman screaming in pain. I built up the fire, shotgun loaded with buckshot laid across my lap. Didn't sleep much. I told myself they were just sounds, tricks the wind plays in these old forests. But that smell, those tracks, they haunted my dreams all the same. Morning came, and I hiked back with the first light. Didn't want to stay another night. Had to pass that carcass again. It was gone. Not dragged off, gone. Like it had walked itself away, even half-eaten as it was. I ran the rest of that line, traps untouched. Never went back to that cabin, not even to pick up my gear. Some lines aren't worth running. Some places aren't worth the risk. I learned something out there. There are corners in these woods dark corners, where the old stories might be true. The stories about things with too many teeth and eyes that glow like embers in the dark. Things that walk upright, but ain't human. I ran into a park ranger a few weeks later, on my way to new trapping grounds. Told him what I saw, about the carcass, the tracks. Figured it was worth reporting, might be a new predator or something diseased. That ranger, he didn't laugh. Just got that grim look in his eye that old-timers around here sometimes get. Then said, Sounds like you had yourself a run-in with the dogman. Said there were sightings going back generations. Native legends, too. Said he didn't believe it. Not fully. But that he'd seen some things that made him wonder. I don't wonder anymore. I've seen proof that the world's a hair bigger and a lot darker than we think. I stick to logging now, working with crews, safer that way. Sometimes, though, I dream about that scream and the smell of rot. I wake up, look over to my old hunting dog curled up by the fire, and try to pretend he could protect me from the things that slip through the shadows, from the things that might have a name but are better left unspoken. My name is Miles Harrison, and this happened to me in the spring of 2012. I'm a covert ops specialist for the CIA. That's the cleaned-up version. The truth is I handle the dirty work no official report will ever acknowledge. Spent half my life overseas, in the shadows, so when they tell me to pack my bags for a domestic assignment, I know something's gone seriously wrong. The briefing was short and unsettling. Outbreaks of extreme violence in a stretch of remote Appalachian forest land. Multiple missing persons reports, mostly out-of-town hikers and campers, the kind easily dismissed as accidents, if not for the sheer volume. My gut instinct said drug cartel, gone feral off-grid. Seen things like that in South America. But this was America, and my superiors were jumpy whispering about bioterrorism and the like. I set up camp near the edge of the forest, an old fishing shack on a barely used road. Locals weren't much help, tight-lipped, looking at me like I was the threat, not whatever lurked in those woods. They called the disappearances the hush. Folks go in, nobody comes out, no bodies ever found. Spent my first few days doing recon, the forest was eerily silent. Not the normal chirps and rustles of life, but a heavy, oppressive quiet that settled over you like a damp blanket. Even in the height of summer, there was a coldness in the air that made my skin crawl. A couple of times I heard noises, shuffling sounds, the crack of a branch but too far away to pinpoint. It felt like being watched, a prickly sensation of unseen eyes tracking my every move, I started leaving trail markers, bits of colored fabric tied to trees, a broken twig propped against a rock. Just little things, but the kind a savvy tracker like myself could notice if they were disturbed. Then, on my fifth night out, something changed. An animal, I told myself at first. Big one. Maybe a bear. 
The low growls were guttural, laced with something I wouldn't label hunger. It circled my cabin, close enough that I could hear it breathing, feel the vibrations of its footsteps against the worn floorboards. I holed up inside, rifle trained on the door. Adrenaline thrummed through me, the taste of copper in my mouth. Part of me, the old operative part, was coldly assessing the perimeter, the weak points, how long I could hold out. And then it let loose a howl, a high-pitched screech that split the night and made my blood run cold. This wasn't a bear. It wasn't any damn thing I could name. The sun rose and the noises stopped. I ventured out cautiously, weapon at the ready. All was still, but the cabin had been marked, shallow claw marks across the door and splatters of something dark and sticky that I didn't want to identify. I spent the day setting traps, the kind used on big game in Africa, and rigging the perimeter with motion sensor lights. My hands moved efficiently, but my mind raced. This assignment went way beyond my pay grade. I needed backup, experts, anyone who could explain what in the fresh hell I was up against. The radio signal was spotty out here. I finally managed to get a message out, garbled, full of static, but enough to get the point across that the situation was officially out of control. The reply was curt, promising a team en route. Estimated arrival, two days. Two days with my back against the wall, alone against whatever stalked these woods. Night fell, and it brought terror with it. My traps remained undisturbed, a testament to whatever creature was hunting me being too cunning or too unnatural to be caught like an animal. The noises were different this time, more purposeful. I picked up movement on two corners of the cabin simultaneously. Then, the roof. A low, rasping sound, like nails across slate. I fired at the ceiling, more out of panic than strategy. Wood splintered, revealing a glimpse of the night sky and, dear God, two eyes glowing crimson in the darkness. I scrambled back as something heavy landed on the floorboards above me, causing the whole cabin to groan in protest. Panic fueled me now. I threw a flare out the window, the burst of light momentarily cutting through the gloom. It was then that I truly saw it. A blur of bone-white flesh streaked with dried blood, a skeletal torso balanced on impossibly long limbs that ended in vicious claws. Its head. It had the shape of a human skull, but stretched and twisted into something wrong, a gaping maw lined with rows of serrated teeth. I fired at it. Bullets ripped into its form, and it howled in rage, but didn't go down. It tore through the roof, escaping with a final screech that echoed in my ears long after the maddening silence had returned. The aftermath of the attack was pure chaos. The flare had lit some of the undergrowth, sending flames racing through the dry brush. I had to move, get out ahead of the inferno. Grabbing whatever gear I could salvage, I bolted out the back door as the cabin started to collapse in on itself. The fire at my back offered some twisted protection. I doubted the creature would risk the flames in pursuit, but I couldn't linger. I sprinted through the trees, the smoke and darkness blinding me forcing me to navigate by instinct and a fading familiarity with the layout of the land from my initial recon runs. My trail markers, they were gone, torn down, destroyed, or consumed by the blaze. I was well and truly lost, with whatever beast I'd enraged somewhere out there, biding its time in the night. The firestorm raged for hours, turning a swath of the forest into a charred wasteland. Come dawn, I found myself on a barren, rocky outcrop and did a shaky headcount. I'd lost the trail cams, most of my food rations, and was down to a few precious rounds of ammunition. On any other op, this would have sent me into crisis prep mode. But after the night I'd just endured, there was a grim acceptance. Standard survival protocols didn't matter when the enemy wasn't human. I spent a chilling day nestled in a crag, the distant smoke a constant reminder of the destruction I'd left behind. It gnawed at me, 
the thought of the locals caught in the crossfire. Were they all right? What if the creature, driven from its usual hunting grounds, turned its rage on them? I used what was left of the daylight to relocate, found a cave in a nearby ridge, defensible, a good vantage point. It seemed untouched, no signs of blood or recent habitation. Yet, I couldn't shake the sense of trespass, like I was barging into a predator's den. Night descended, bringing the noises back. Not the brazen attack of before, but a more cautious circling. It knew where I was. I barricaded the cave entrance as best I could, a pathetic shield against the strength I'd witnessed firsthand. My only advantage? This place was tight, limiting its maneuverability. If it came for me here, maybe, just maybe, I wouldn't go down without a fight. The standoff lasted hours. I sat in the darkness, rifle trembling in my sweaty hands, eyes glued to the slivers of moonlight coming through the barricade. Every rustle of dry leaves, every snap of a distant twig, sent my heart thudding. It came not through attack, but subterfuge. A sound directly above my cave, a scraping like claws against stone. It was on the roof, trying to get in from a different angle. I aimed, fired, and the noise ceased abruptly, followed by a heavy thump. Silence stretched on. Had I hit it? Killed it? I didn't dare hope. Something stank outside the cave, a rotting, fetid odor that turned my stomach. First light came, and cautiously I moved the barricade. The creature lay just outside, sprawled on the rocks. In death, it looked smaller, almost pathetic. Sunlight revealed the extent of the damage I'd inflicted. Several bullet holes peppered its torso. One had pierced an eye socket. But what made my breath hitch was the wound on the underside of its neck. Not a gunshot, but a long, ragged slash, like something else had clawed its way through its throat. I never got my backup team. By the time I made my way down to a ranger station, half-starved and babbling a lunatic's account, the only evidence I could offer was my mangled radio and the decaying corpse rapidly being dismissed as a bear carcass mangled by coyotes. The official's eyes said it all. Wilderness shock, battle fatigue, maybe even a touch of pity. My return to civilization was a nightmare of its own. Classified debriefs, psych evals, the cold analysis of men in suits who saw a traumatized agent not the unnatural horror I'd faced. They offered me reassignment, a quiet desk job where no one would question my sanity. I turned it down. Told them if they saw monsters in that forest, they could damn well find someone else to fight them. I sold my old condo, bought a used truck, and headed north, far away from the oppressive hush of those Appalachians found a tiny cabin for sale in the Alaskan backcountry. It's a different kind of isolation out here, clean and harsh in its vastness. They have bears, too, but the mundane kind, the kind you can track and anticipate. Most nights I sleep soundly, lulled by the wind and the creak of old wood. But some nights I wake up in a cold sweat, the smell of decay filling my nostrils my rifles propped beside the door, just in case. And when the wind whistles through the distant peaks, it sounds a hell of a lot like that same bone-chilling howl that haunts my nightmares. Because the men in suits, they never got the full truth. That thing out in the woods, it wasn't the first of its kind. It wasn't alone. This happened to me a few years back. Times lost all meaning, if I had to guess. Maybe five, six years at least. Me? Well, my name's Kellen. I'm no one special. Ex-cop, now making a living driving a delivery truck. Long routes, boring scenery. The kind of job where your brain turns to mush and you start imagining stupid stuff to keep awake. I guess sometimes, those stupid little fancies bleed into reality. This whole trip started because of a detour. 
Interstate 90, somewhere along the eastern Montana stretch. Road had some construction going on. Detour signs pointing all traffic down a state highway. Seemed temporary, but hey, less trucks around? That's an easy win in my book. This highway just goes and goes. Straight, flat. Endless fields of dry prairie grass on either side. Not a tree in sight. Hours pass. My eyes start bleeding from the relentless monotony. Just as I figure I'm ready to scream to break the silence, a turnout appears. Barely any room for my truck, but my bladder had other plans. As I'm taking care of business, I take a good look around at this place. That's when the weirdness begins. Right by the roadside, nestled among that tall grass, there's a... Well, can't think of another word but shrine. Tiny pile of rocks stacked neatly, topped by what looked like bone. Maybe an animal skull, hard to tell from a distance. Some colored yarn threads tied in knots all around, dangling in the wind. There's this flash of cloth, too, almost like a dress, faded colors, half buried in the grass. Whole thing set my teeth on edge, couldn't explain why. Not my thing, maybe some local native stuff. But you've got to wonder why put it right here by the road. Figured that detour was going to haunt me anyway, so might as well stretch my legs, try to ignore the creeping feeling of unease. Walked back the way I came, looking for an entry point or road leading off that might explain that stuff. Didn't find a thing. Only a broken down wire fence separating that endless wheat field from the highway. No way that little shrine made sense out there. Shrugged. Told myself I was seeing things, got back in my truck, and got lost in the road again. By the time the sun started going down, I'd reached my limit. This little rest stop showed up just when I was ready to pull over on the side and sleep in the damn cab. Just off the highway, big, empty gravel lot, the type truckers use for an overnight camp. I was glad of the company, even if it just meant rows of silent rigs for neighbors. Locked up my truck, ate a lousy microwave dinner, crashed as best I could in the bunk at the back. And that's when it got a whole lot less normal. Woke up in the middle of the night. Sound of something rattling on the side of the truck woke me. Sounded like fingernails, scrabbling, but too deep for any animal. Didn't dare even get a peek through the cab window. Figured a bear had moved further and leave on its own soon enough. Thing just kept circling my truck. Scratching all along the panels, grunting to itself. Then, silence. Finally got the courage to glance outside. Nothing. Relieved, started going back to sleep when I heard footsteps. Human footsteps, heavy enough to shake the truck. Something banged hard on the roof, right above my head. Knew it wasn't smart. Knew it just got a whole lot creepier. But I was running on cop instinct now grabbed my gun, slipped behind the steering wheel, turned on the headlights. Outside, framed in that blinding light, stood. He was huge. At least seven feet tall, maybe taller. Naked except for what looked like ragged old deerskin wrapped around his hips. Wild mane of hair, long beard all covered in mud and God knows what else. But even though it was dark, could see those sharp, jagged teeth in his mouth as he snarled at the light. And that smell. Rot. Meat. Something I didn't want to even try to name. My gun felt a lot less sure when I pointed it at him. Didn't matter anyway. He was moving quicker than anything that size should, lunging towards the truck before I could even take aim. His fingers scrabbled against the door handle, ripping the metal out of shape. Blind panic kicked in, shifted to drive, slammed on the gas. Thank God the engine turned over first try, got out of there fast, looking back only long enough to see his form getting smaller in the rearview mirror, lost in the glare of my taillights. Didn't stop driving till I crossed the state border, slept at a gas station with all the lights on. I know it sounds nuts. Feral caveman attacks trucker? Guy survived out there without tools or even clothes? You'd report it, but guess what? Police checked out that rest stop later on. Didn't find a trace of what happened. My rig didn't even have those claw marks anymore. It's like the whole thing vanished. 
left only in my memory. Maybe that detour did more than throw me off course. Maybe I stepped off the real world road into some messed up place on the fringe. That night changed me though. It wasn't just about some monster. It was like that guy knew exactly who I was inside. Knew every time I'd pulled over to avoid some critter I was supposed to hit. Every time I chose not to follow procedure because it took too long. Like I got marked or something. That fear still haunts me. Doesn't matter where I go. How much routine I get into. Part of me knows he's still out there. Looking. Waiting. This happened to me a few years ago. Not sure how long exactly. Time gets slippery in memory, especially after something like that. My buddy Kale and I decided on an RV trip out to Oregon as a bit of a post-college jaunt. Typical stuff. Hiking, campfires, maybe a dip in a crater lake. Neither of us are what you'd call city folk, more rugged country types. It's in the blood, I guess. Anyhow... After picking up the RV, we headed further up into the wilds of Oregon, winding our way towards Crater Lake. We passed through one tiny town after another, names just a flicker on the map. Eventually, we found ourselves somewhere off the beaten path. Perfect spot, Kale figured. Isolated, scenic, all that good stuff. We pulled the RV onto a small dirt road leading into the trees. Tall pines lined the way, sunbeams streaking through their branches. Not your usual postcard perfect vista, but that was how we liked it. After claiming our space by a stream, we went exploring the area. Not too far in, we came across a ramshackle cabin. Didn't look occupied, a good thing. Not that we expected trouble out here. Kale's adventurous streak flared up. Dude, come on, gotta check it out. My usual skepticism kicked in. I don't know, man. Looks off. Ah... Don't be a chicken, Noah. You only live once, right? Kale had a way of making sense sound reckless. Against my better judgment, I relented. The cabin was as unnerving inside as it seemed from outside. Rotting wood, an odd musty smell, and enough dust bunnies to choke a woolly mammoth. We were pretty grossed out. One half-collapsed room hinted at whatever incident led to the place being abandoned. My initial unease started edging into full-blown jitters. Okay, seen enough, I said, pushing back into the dying sunlight. Kale followed, grumbling about me being no fun. We chalked it up to another piece of rural living and made our way back to camp. That night, we got settled under a dazzling starlit sky. I can't recall much of our chatter at this point. Probably the usual mix of bad jokes and ambitious post-adventure plans. After everything that happened, that normalcy seems impossibly far away. My last clear memory is of the crack of a branch behind me and the feeling of someone watching. Woke up in a cold sweat, heart pounding, disoriented. My first panic check was for Kale, empty sleeping bag. I stumbled from the RV, adrenaline surging. Then I saw it, a smear of blood on the step outside the RV. It couldn't be. That's when I heard it, a ragged yell cut short, fading into the distance. Kale. Terror was in my throat, but instinct forced my feet to follow the chilling sounds. Stumbling deeper into the shadowed woods, my mind desperately searched for clues. A blood trail, footprints, anything. Desperation and the darkness played cruel tricks on my eyesight. A flicker of movement here, a branch shifting there. And then, him. Tall, lean, in worn overalls, his face hidden under a filthy baseball cap. All those stories, dismissed as rural tales, suddenly seemed unbearably real. There was a flash of metal in his hand, a hatchet. My mind supplied the image of that thing buried in Kale's back. His presence wasn't eerie or supernatural. It was the pure brutality of a wild animal, and I was his cornered prey. There was no discussion, no reasoning, just primal terror 
and the surge to keep breathing. Every instinct within me screamed to run like hell. I turned, adrenaline-fueling muscles I didn't know I had, and tore back through the undergrowth, branches slicing my face. I never saw him in pursuit, but his presence haunted those woods. Every snap of a twig, every rustle, the heavy tread I prayed was all in my head. When I finally reached a dirt track, collapsing in exhaustion, relief was a distant feeling. This nightmare might not be over yet. A truck passed, hours later. Flag them down? Yes, of course. But some sliver of terror held me back. What if this isn't real help? What if there's more of them out there? Every cell in my body was primed for another attack. So, I kept hidden. Just out of sight. Crazy? Sure. But alive. For now. I eventually stumbled onto a highway where some kindly folks heard my crazed tale, or as much as I could manage. No sign of Kale or him was ever found. Police chalked it up to an animal attack on Kale, some drifter incident with me. Convenient, but wrong. It wasn't that neat or safe. They don't know he's still out there, waiting for the next adventurers to cross his path. The cabin stands as a warning, and this story... Well, it's out there now. Do with it what you will. I don't care anymore if folks believe me or not. I lived it. That's my truth. Maybe a warning is all the good those awful events can have. Stay aware, trust your gut. Because out there among the stunning vistas, darkness lingers. It was the beginning of November 2013. I remember because I had just celebrated my birthday a few days prior. I was driving back to my apartment after a long day at work, cracking jokes with myself in the car to keep my spirits up. Little did I know that this seemingly normal night would become one I'd never forget. My name is Blaze Winters, and I'm your average guy living in the small town of Scobie, Montana. Scobie is a quiet place with friendly neighbors and a tight-knit community. The kind of place where everyone knows everyone else's business. That night, I decided to take a detour through a remote part of the town out of sheer curiosity. It was an area known for its abandoned farmhouses and desolate landscapes, not exactly a tourist hotspot. The moon shone brightly as it hung in the crisp autumn sky, casting eerie shadows that danced around the landscape. I continued down the road until I reached the outskirts of an old farmhouse that looked surprisingly well kept, considering its age. Feeling curious, I pulled over and got out of my car to investigate further. As I approached the house, I couldn't help but sense a strange feeling, like someone or something was watching me. Suddenly, out of nowhere, three children appeared on the porch of the worn-down house, Covered almost entirely in shadows, it was difficult to make out their features at first. But when they stepped closer, into what little light there was, it became all too clear. Their eyes were pitch black and void of any emotion or warmth. Hey, kids, is everything all right? My voice faltered slightly as I tried to hold on to whatever shred of composure remained with me. They stared at me with an unsettling intensity but did not respond. Caught off guard and unsure how to proceed with this bizarre encounter, my mind frantically searched for answers while simultaneously trying to figure out a way to help. Maybe they needed someone to call their parents or were lost. Regardless, I knew I couldn't simply ignore them. Well, uh, you guys need any help or something? A beat of silence passed before one of the black-eyed children finally spoke with a cold, unnerving voice. We need you to give us a ride home. There was an unnatural firmness in the child's tone that sent an instant shiver down my spine. It was almost like listening to a machine. Uh, I'm not sure if that's such a good idea. Despite my instinct screaming at me to run, I hesitated. What if they really were just kids in need, 
victims of some cruel prank gone wrong. We know you want to help us, Blaze, the child closest to me said, narrowing his dark eyes as he somehow knew my name. That was the final straw. I turned around and started running back towards my car, but as I fumbled with my keys, I could hear their feet rapidly approaching. Fully aware of how much trouble I was in now, panic surged through me as I finally managed to unlock the door and start the engine. With tires screeching on the loose gravel road, I gunned it forward, the children mere inches from reaching out and grabbing hold of the car. As my heart pounded wildly in my chest and the adrenaline coursed through my veins, I glanced into my rearview mirror. To my horror, they were still chasing after me, their eyes glinting malevolently in the moonlight. My stomach nodded as the realization dawned on me. I might not make it out of this alive. As I sped away, I decided to call the police, hoping they could somehow intervene and help me deal with these relentless children. My hands shook as I dialed the emergency number and tried to explain the situation. I need help. There are these kids, with black eyes, chasing my car. They're not giving up, and it's terrifying, I said, struggling to keep my voice steady. Sir, could you please provide us with your location? The operator asked. While informing the operator about my location, I noticed a truck stop up ahead. Desperate for any chance at escaping or seeking help from others, I decided to pull in and pleaded for the operator to send help there. When I arrived at the truck stop, the black-eyed children seemed to have momentarily disappeared. The place was bustling with activity, truck drivers chatting and refueling, late-night travelers taking a break from their drives. Grateful for their presence, I stepped out of my car and went inside the shop. While waiting for the police to arrive, I approached one of the truckers inside and shared my horrifying experience. He looked at me with concern, but admitted that he had no idea what these children could be or what they wanted from me. He graciously offered to stay with me until the police arrived. Eventually, the police officers arrived and listened intently as I recounted my terrifying encounter. They seemed skeptical at first, but agreed to search the area for any sign of these strange children. As we walked outside with the officers, we realized that all of the other people at the truck stop had inexplicably disappeared. Panic set in as we cautiously scanned our surroundings for any indication of where they could have gone. In that moment, both officers looked towards a dense wooded area behind the truck stop as sinister laughter echoed through and several child-sized silhouettes emerged. There was no mistaking it. Those were the black-eyed children. Realizing the immediate danger, one of the officers quickly radioed for backup while the other ushered me back inside the shop and locked the doors. The trucker, who had accompanied me earlier, grabbed a crowbar from behind the counter to protect us if necessary. The black-eyed children continued to advance, and their twisted smiles and menacing laughter sent chills down my spine. I silently prayed that backup would arrive before they could break through the locked door. Sure enough, within minutes, I could hear sirens approaching in the distance. The black-eyed children stopped in their tracks and exchanged sinister glances before retreating back into the woods from whence they came. Backup arrived and combed through the dense wooded area with searchlights and dogs, but there was no trace of the mysterious children. The missing people from the truck stop never reappeared, and their unexplained disappearance weighed heavily on our minds. The authorities made sure I got to a safe location that night before they continued their investigations. As I sat at home, wondering what had become of those people, I couldn't shake off my sense of dread, which seemed to linger around me ever since that terrifying encounter with those black-eyed children. Ever had that prickling sensation creep up your spine at work, like you're in one of those horror movies and you're the character who's about to get it? Me too, except this wasn't Hollywood. This was deep in the heart of Oregon's lush forests, and I wasn't an actor. I was a bioengineer named Jasper Eklund. 
Our job at the secluded government facility was to monkey around with genes that could revolutionize medicine, or so we told ourselves to sleep at night. The lab stood inconspicuously against the dense backdrop of evergreens and ferns, a metallic anomaly hidden away from the serenity outside. My colleagues were a motley crew, Tilda Koenig, our microbiologist with the wild hair and disposition to match, and Grover Hitch, the guy you'd trust more with a petri dish than a conversation about the weather. One late afternoon, we were huddled around watching cells dance under Grover's microscope when an ear-splitting scream echoed through the corridors. It was Tilda. We dashed out, nearly tripping over each other. The scream wasn't just petrifying. It had this jagged pitch to it, like nails on chalkboard, that suggested something very wrong. We found nothing but her notes scattered on the floor and an open rear exit door swinging in the wind, leading out into the forest. With no cell service and our nearest help miles away, calling for assistance wasn't an option. Heck of a time for her to play hide-and-seek. Grover tried to lighten up the mood, failing miserably as we peered into the darkening woodland. It felt straight out of a twisted campfire tale, grabbing flashlights and my trusty Glock, just in case wildlife got too curious. We initiated a search pattern through thick underbrush and overgrowth. We shouted Tilda's name until our voices were hoarse. No response ever came. An unmistakable stench hit us before we saw it. Something was dead nearby. A fresh kill, not uncommon in the forest, but chilling given Tilda's disappearance. That's when we saw it perched in shadow, a grotesque semblance of something human but twisted by foul play with nature. Elongated limbs wrapped in tattered clothes that could have been Tilda's lab coat. Grover gasped beside me but kept his wits. If that's a bear, I'm Elon Musk, he muttered, probably louder than he intended. I could only think to say something about how bears didn't wear lab coats or look like they stepped out of mythology text, but my heart hammered against my chest so hard I feared it might leap out. The creature's sharp eyes glinted like knives as we locked gazes. A grisly tableau surrounded us, trees marked with deep gouges and ground torn up beneath our feet. I didn't need to be Sherlock Holmes to connect dots that suggested this beast had something serious against nature itself or things trespassing its territory. Grover Veni Vidi Vici, I jested nervously as we stood back to back, trying not to think of what Vici might entail with whatever lurked just beyond our flashlight beams. What happened next has haunted my nights ever since. A shrill cry pierced through other night sounds, a colleague's voice barely recognizable after piercing fear had laced through it. And then, there was silence again, thick enough you could slice it with Grover's microscope slides, if only he hadn't dropped them when that thing made its first bone-chilling growl. I grabbed Grover's arm and whispered, We need to make a run for the car. No sooner had I spoken than an immense shape charged out of the darkness directly at us. It was huge, covered in coarse fur, its eyes reflecting the dim light from our flashlights. I did not have time to make out more details. Survival instincts took over. We broke into a run. The creature gave chase. Its heavy footsteps thudded behind us, each one echoing like a gunshot through the night. Branches snapped under its weight as it barreled through the underbrush with an almost mechanical preciseness. We ran hard, breath heaving from our chests. Grover slipped once, but I pulled him up without halting our pace. Our car lay a good mile down an old dirt path we'd taken into the woods, and with each step, that mile felt longer. The path ahead was rough. Roots threatened to trip us, and several times we narrowly dodged low-hanging branches that reached out like clawed hands. But we could not waste precious seconds on caution. Speed was our only advantage. I dared to look back just once and caught sight of dark fur shifting between trees. The creature was closing in. Grover saw it too. We won't make it, he gasped out between labored breaths. There was truth to his words. Our legs were burning from exertion, and the car seemed no closer than before. 
Then Grover yelled suddenly as he fell, his ankle caught between two hidden rocks. I turned back, pulling him up, but when I glanced back again, the creature had vanished. We listened for it but heard nothing over our pounding hearts and ragged breaths. Why weren't we calling for help? Simply put, there was no time. Reception was a dream in these thick woods, and by the time help arrived, if they even found us, it would be too late. Time passed slowly as we stood there, listening, waiting for the creature plagued by an insatiable rage to re-emerge from the shadows and end what it started. But it didn't come back out. I supported Grover as best I could, an arm slung around my shoulders, and we stumbled forward once more. The thought, never far away, that every step might be swiftly countered by whatever horror lurked here. Somehow, more by luck than anything, we made it back to the car unscathed, though what happened to that colleague of ours remained a mystery neither of us wanted to solve. I fumbled with keys before revving the engine alive, a sweet mechanical roar after all those organic sounds of terror and we didn't stop accelerating until city lights replaced shadows and civilization drowned out traces of wilderness madness. Days passed before local authorities investigated, only after our frantic calls about a missing fellow scientist prompted them to do so. They found some remains later identified as Cora's. She must have been the cry we heard that night, and termed it an animal attack. Some species undocumented but real enough to leave scars both physical and otherwise on those who encountered it. Grover quit fieldwork after that night. He bore witness to something unnatural, or at least unexplained, and preferred laboratories where variables were confined to petri dishes since then. As for me, well, I don't venture into deep woods anymore either. Survival guilt lingers like early morning fog even when sun shines overhead. Cora did not make it while we did, but there's no rhyme or reason behind most of life's cruel twists of fate. March 23rd, 2010. I was working some seasonal construction gig and finally saved enough to get that plot of land up in the Alaskan backcountry. Been dreaming of doing it proper since I was a kid, you know? Getting off the grid, living free. Name's Everett. Everett Barnes. Folks called me Ev, but out there, I was just me. First year was a rude awakening. I ain't ashamed to admit it. Thought I knew survival stuff. Camping trips. Hunting with my old man in the backwoods of Michigan. Alaska? That was an entirely different beast. Winter came down like a hammer. My woodpile wasn't nearly big enough. Cabin was draftier than I thought. I nearly packed it in. Could have driven my beat-up truck back down south, swallowed my pride. But something in me kept going, learned from my mistakes, got resourceful. Second year was better, third year even more so. By that fifth year, I felt like I finally got the hang of it. My garden was doing great. I'd set up a smokehouse, even made friends with a few folks from the nearest small town a half-day's hike away. Life was simple. Even lonely sometimes, but it was mine. Then the day came when everything changed. I was headed down to the river to check my fishing lines. It was still early spring, the meltwater high and fast. Figured the trout might be biting. I'd gotten careless, no gun, not even a big knife, since it was such a familiar route. My first mistake. Heard a sound that set my teeth on edge. Kind of a chittering like nothing I'd encountered before. Then a low growl echoed through the trees, deeper than a bear. That's when the smell hit me, a sickly, rotten kind of stink that made me gag. I didn't wait around to find out what made it. I took off running, heart pounding so loud, I was afraid it would give me away. Tripped over a root, slammed my knee on a rock. Didn't matter. I scrambled up, tasting blood in my mouth kept glancing over my shoulder expecting something. Problem was, I still had no idea what I was running from. Busted through the trees onto the riverbank and froze. My fishing line wasn't just caught, 
It had been shredded, and something left a trophy. Laid out across a flat rock was the head of a buck. I recognized it. Belonged to a deer that had been hanging around my cabin. Its eyes stared wide and empty. But the head, it was mostly clean of flesh, like something gnawed the meat down to the bone. Suddenly, a rustle from upstream. I turned just in time to see it, crouched on a boulder, hunched like it was made of too many angles, tall, at least eight feet, with scrawny limbs that ended in long yellowish claws. Its skin was leathery and dark like tree bark, and the head, it was the stuff of nightmares, kind of like a wolf but twisted all wrong, the snout too long and the teeth too sharp, like rows of razors. The creature stared at me with eyes that glowed a sickly yellow. It let out a hissing snarl, then sprang. I barely had time to dive into the river. The icy water shocked the breath out of me, but it didn't slow that. That thing down. It crashed into the shallows, the water churning. I swam, frantic, the current helping and hindering me all at once. I expected a swipe of claws, the sudden pain of being dragged under but nothing came. I risked a look over my shoulder. That creature was on the bank, pacing. It howled, the sound echoing off the hillsides, and then it vanished back into the forest. It took me hours to find my way back to the cabin. I stumbled in, bolted the door, and collapsed onto my bed, shivering even with blankets piled on top of me. Next morning, I surveyed the damage. Footprints circled the cabin, Big as dinner plates, the clawed toes deeply imprinted in the mud. No way an animal I knew could leave tracks like that. I also found a trail of thick brownish blood leading away into the woods. Seemed at least I managed to wound the thing. I cleaned up as best I could, then packed a bag. There was no way I was staying. Whatever that creature was, I didn't want another round with it. I left behind most of my stuff, years of work. Didn't care. I hiked out of there like a bat out of hell. Never looked back. When I finally got to town, I found a bar and drank until I couldn't see straight. Some guys overheard me ranting about a monster in the woods. Laughed at me. Called me crazy. I let them. Got some odd jobs. Saved up enough to get as far away from Alaska as possible. Found myself down near the Florida swamps of all places. Figured if anything wanted to eat me alive... At least the gators would be familiar company. Still see that creature in my nightmares, though. Hear it snarls. Smell that rotten stink. People tell me to put it behind me, like it was some bad dream. But I know what I saw. They even have a name for it. Those who believe the Adlet. Some Inuit legend about a shape-shifting beast with a hunger for human flesh. Maybe I'm crazy now. Maybe I was always crazy enough to think I could take on the Alaskan wilderness alone. All I know is this. There are things in this world that don't fit into neat little nature documentaries. Things that remind you that even when you think you're the hunter, you might just be the prey. My name is Alex Thorne and this happened to me on July 22, 1997, a day etched into my memory like a fresh scar. I was working undercover at the time. Not your typical CIA desk job, no sir. My team operated in the shadows, handling threats that never made the evening news. The kind of work that earned you enemies but never a commendation medal. Three years back, I had a wife. Sarah. She was the light that drew me back from the darkness of my job. Then came that damn phone call, a car accident, and with it, my world went dark. I buried myself deeper into my work. It was the only way I knew how to cope. This particular assignment was, well, bizarre even by my standards. Something unsettling was brewing deep in the Ozarks. Reports of disappearances... Locals whispering about strange lights in the forest. Cattle mutilations. The official explanation was a drug cartel using the backwoods for nefarious activities. But after years on the job, you develop a sixth sense for when something just doesn't add up. 
My partner Donovan was a no-nonsense ex-marine, built like a tank with a voice that could rattle windows. Don't overthink it, Thorn, he'd growl whenever I'd voice my suspicions. Cartel thugs, pure and simple. The target was a remote farmhouse nestled amidst rolling hills cloaked in dense forest. Our intel was sketchy. Suspected drug lab, heavily armed, orders to infiltrate and secure evidence. Standard stuff, at least on the surface. Daylight was fading as we approached the farmhouse. An unnatural stillness choked the air. Donovan held up a fist, signaling a halt. Hold up, something's not right. Too quiet. I knew exactly what he meant. There was no hum of a generator, no flicker of lights, none of the usual signs of a remote operation. The hair prickled on the back of my neck. You finally getting those spook vibes too? I joked, trying to mask my growing unease. Donovan grunted, his eyes narrowed. This place has got a bad smell to it, Thorn. We moved as one, weapons drawn, boots crunching on gravel. Each step seemed to amplify the oppressive silence. I reached the weathered wooden porch, Donovan covering my back. The front door hung slightly ajar. You take point, Donovan said, already shouldering his rifle. I eased the door inward, peering into the gloom. The living room was a scene of frozen chaos, an overturned table, scattered papers, chairs lying on their sides as if knocked over in a hurry. Frowning, I took a cautious step inside. From the corner of my eye, I caught a flicker of movement in the hallway. I whipped around, rifle raised, but there was nothing there. Donovan, I saw it too, he muttered, his voice tense. Something ain't right here. We advanced, sweeping each room, kitchen, bedrooms, all empty, all showing signs of a hasty departure. Reaching the back of the house, I noticed a door leading down into a cellar. Even from where I stood, a faint, rotten stench drifted up, causing a wave of nausea to wash over me. Donovan nudged me with an elbow. Well, we ain't gonna find any meth cookers down there. I flicked on my flashlight, the beam slicing into the inky depths. I'll go first. Keep me covered, I said, the words coming out tighter than I intended. He didn't argue, merely nodded grimly. Taking a steadying breath, I began to descend the rickety wooden stairs. With each creak, my unease deepened. The beam of my flashlight illuminated a small, earthen-floored room. My stomach churned at the sight that awaited me. It was a scene ripped straight from a nightmare. Animal carcasses, deer, raccoons, maybe even a dog, lay in twisted piles, the floor awash in gore but it was the way the bodies were mutilated, the unnatural angles and gaping wounds that sent a jolt of pure horror through me. Sweet Jesus, Donovan muttered from above. I wanted to run, just turn and flee from this place of madness, but duty, or perhaps some flicker of morbid curiosity, kept me rooted to the spot. Slowly, I panned my light around the room. It snagged on something propped in the far corner, half hidden by shadows, a newspaper clipping pinned to the damp earth wall. The headline made my blood run cold. Locals baffled, sixth unexplained disappearance in two months. My breath hitched as I scanned the accompanying article. It detailed the vanishing of the farmhouse residents, a family of four. No trace, no clues, only whispers of strange occurrences in the weeks leading up to their disappearance. As I read, an icy dread settled over me. We weren't dealing with drug dealers. We were dealing with something else entirely. My flashlight beam darted back to the carcasses. These weren't the work of any wild animal. They were trophies, left behind by something both monstrous and methodical. A low growl echoed from the darkness, snapping my head around. Donovan shouted a warning from the top of the stairs, his voice laced with panic. Before I could register his words, the cellar erupted. A hulking form lunged from the shadows, a whirlwind of claws and teeth. I stumbled back, firing blindly as the creature barreled into me. 
The stench of it was overpowering, a mix of decay and something sulfurous that burned my lungs. Donovan's rifle roared from above, bullets tearing into the monstrosity. It roared, less like an animal and more like some twisted parody of a human scream. The force of the impact knocked me to the cellar floor, my rifle skittering away. Dazed, the world spinning, I saw a massive clawed hand swipe towards me. A searing pain ripped through my forearm. I scrambled away, scrambling for purchase on the slick, blood-soaked floor. The creature loomed over me, its silhouette a jagged distortion in the dim light filtering from above. For the first time, I got a clear look at it. It was massive, easily seven feet tall when hunched. Thick, leathery skin stretched over bulging muscles. The head was elongated, the muzzle filled with rows of razor-sharp teeth. But it was the eyes that sent shivers down my spine, glowing crimson orbs filled with a ravenous hunger. Another swipe of its claws sent me tumbling. The world tilted crazily, the creature's roar echoing in my skull. It pounced, pinning me to the floor with a weight that threatened to crush me. Hot, rancid breath washed over my face. I thrashed uselessly, but the creature held me fast. I was trapped, my final moments spent staring into the depths of those inhuman eyes. Suddenly, a flicker of movement above. Donovan, vaulting over the cellar railing, his rifle shattering the silence. The creature twisted its head, momentarily distracted. With a desperate surge of strength, I shoved against its chest, buying enough space to roll sideways. Donovan hit the floor beside me. His rifle barked again, the concussive blasts deafening in the enclosed space. I staggered upright, my vision swimming. The creature was wounded, crimson streaming from its flank, but it was far from dead. It circled us, low growls rumbling deep in its throat. Donovan ejected a spent clip and slammed in a fresh one. Thorn, get the hell out of here, he shouted. I didn't need telling twice. I scrambled for the stairs, my pulse hammering in my ears. Reaching the top, I risked a glance back. Donovan had emptied his magazine into the creature. It staggered, but still it came on. He fumbled for another clip, his face a mask of grim determination. There wasn't time. The creature lunged, a blur of claws and teeth. Donovan shouted a curse, throwing up his rifle in a futile attempt to block the attack. And then it was on him, a sickening symphony of tearing flesh and splintering bone echoing up the stairwell. My legs acted before my brain could process what I'd just witnessed. I slammed the cellar door shut and fumbled with the bolt. From below came a final, blood-curdling scream followed by a wet tearing sound. Stumbling backwards, I crashed into the kitchen table, sending it toppling. The world spun around me, my stomach lurching. Donovan was gone, sacrificed, buying me a few precious seconds. I didn't wait around to see what would emerge from the cellar. I tore through the kitchen, out the back door, and into the dense, suffocating forest. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs buckled beneath me. Branches whipped my face, thorns tore at my skin. But I didn't stop, the creature's inhuman growls echoing in my mind. I had no idea where I was going, only that I had to put as much distance between me and that accursed farmhouse as I could. Eventually, I stumbled onto a gravel road. In the growing pre-dawn light, I saw a truck approaching. Flagging it down with frantic desperation, I collapsed into the passenger seat, gasping out incoherent half-truths about a hunting accident and a friend in need of help. The driver, a grizzled old farmer, took one look at my wild eyes and blood-soaked clothes and didn't question a word. He drove me to the nearest town, where I made an anonymous call to the agency, my voice shaking. What I reported was standard protocol, an operation gone wrong, a firefight, my partner dead. What I didn't report was the creature. What I didn't report was the gnawing fear that it might still be out there, waiting, hunting. They called me a hero, pinned more medals on my chest, and buried Donovan with full honors. I played my part, the grieving survivor, all the while feeling like a coward who'd abandoned his post. 
In the empty silence of my apartment, the creature haunted my nightmares, its crimson eyes burning in the darkness. I left the agency soon after. Couldn't face the lies. Couldn't face the desks and the suits pretending monsters didn't exist in the shadowy corners of the world. Some cases don't end with closure. They leave scars on your soul. I drifted around for a while, taking odd jobs, trying to outrun my demons, but they always seemed to be one step behind. The truth is, you can't hide from something that might not even be human, something that exists outside the realm of logic and reason. Years have passed, but the memory of that day in the Ozarks hasn't faded. I see the creature's eyes every time I close mine. I hear its guttural growls echoing in my ears. I carry Donovan's death like a stone in my gut. People ask what happened to change me, to harden me. The answer is something they would never believe. Some truths are too terrible, too fantastical to survive the light of day. Those truths they keep locked up in windowless rooms with men in starched suits. I live on the edge of society now, a drifter, a ghost. The world sees me as broken, damaged. Maybe they're right, but then again, maybe I'm the only sane one left, the only one who sees the shadows lurking just out of sight. This happened to me a few years ago. Not sure how long exactly. Time's kind of lost meaning to me out there. I'm always alone in the middle of nowhere when I go camping. My name's Harold, by the way. Been a bit of a wilderness junkie since I retired. Keeps me out of the wife's hair. Lets me clear my head. This trip, I took the RV up into Olympic National Park. If you've never been, try it out sometime. Just incredible out there. Well, after a few days of hiking and fishing, I got the itch to move somewhere new. Packed up the RV, said goodbye to the campground, and started a slow drive along the northern border of the park. Aim was to find a quiet spot along one of the many dirt roads winding through the forest. As luck would have it, a narrow little pull-off appeared after about an hour. It was barely big enough for the RV, some old logging track, I figured perfect enough for me. The first night was just like any other. Made dinner, listened to the owl screech, and read until I dropped off to sleep. The next morning, though, that's when things got weird. You'll think I'm nuts, but it's the damn truth. I went out for an early morning stroll, just clearing my head and enjoying the view. Didn't take more than 20 steps into the woods before I stopped dead in my tracks. There, right on the ground, was the carcass of a deer. Well, more like half a carcass, like something took a huge, messy bite from its side. No way any normal predator did that. Now, Olympic has its share of cougars and the odd bear. But this wasn't their work. Something about the way the thing was torn apart just set my teeth on edge. It was... wrong. Not wanting to dwell on it, I turned around and hurried back to the RV. Later on, figured I'd move down the road a bit, get away from whatever made that mess. No use looking for trouble. When I went to turn the key, though, nothing. RV refused to start. Great. Looks like I was stuck for the time being. Well, not like I could just abandon the thing there. Locked the doors and decided to walk until I found some cell service. Figured a ranger could point me towards a mechanic or something. That walk? Probably was my biggest mistake. See, after an hour or so on that muddy track, I found myself back at the deer carcass. Wasn't just the deer, either. I could hear noises, heavy, shuffling steps coming from the trees. For a brief second I saw... I don't know what. I just caught a glimpse. But it was tall, hunched over, walking on two legs like a man. Not like a normal man, though. This thing was huge covered in what looked like matted fur. Couldn't make out any other details before it ducked behind a tree. But what I did see was enough for me. Fear kicked in, the cold kind that goes through your bones. I ran. By the time I got back to the RV, it was getting dark. 
figured there was no way I was moving again that night. Barricaded myself inside, ate a can of beans, and hoped whatever I saw in the woods stayed the hell away. Every single crack and rustle outside made me jumpy. That's when I noticed it. Footprints. Large, bare footprints left just on the other side of the RV's windshield. Not human by any stretch. Next morning, RV started right up like nothing ever happened. Still nervous as hell, I put that place behind me as fast as could. Never drove those old logging roads again, that's for damn sure. But that thing I saw still gives me chills. Maybe there were two people out there playing a prank. Some sick wilderness cult kind of thing. No footprints from any normal shoes at least. Still doesn't explain the half-eaten deer or how my engine died like someone flipped a switch. People ask why I kept that trip a secret. Why not report it? Get rangers on the trail. Honestly, what would I have told them? That Bigfoot tried to carjack me? Yeah, they'd lock me up in the nutty bin sooner than send out a search party. Now and then, I search the news, you know? Missing persons around the park, anything unusual popping up nearby. Nothing so far, which... That almost worries me more. This happened to me a couple years back. Can't even look at an RV now without wanting to puke. My name's Everett. Back then, me and my wife Nora, well, things got kind of rocky. Thought this could fix it, you know? Grand road trip, quality time, stupid idea. Worst part is, the start went exactly as planned. Everett and Nora had chosen to camp up along the Oregon coast. We rented the classic camper van, figured it'd be easy enough to find spots without having to book campgrounds too far in advance. That sense of freedom. It did help get our heads clearer for a while. Then that little town came rolling along. Gold Beach. Maybe you've heard of it? Quaint little place. Seemed all sunshine and smiles and tourists. Even found a spot with a great view of the ocean. Just pulled off on some empty back road right along the cliffside. That was our first mistake. Night came. Beautiful sunset. Perfect weather. All set up with some barbecue, wine, the whole deal. Then... I went down the slope near the cliff to relieve myself. Saw it in the twilight. Looked like trash at first. Some white plastic caught in the rocks by the shore. Then it moved. Got a better look and realized it was a person. Now, here's where things go wrong. Did I investigate? Nope. Did I go back, tell my wife, find somewhere populated to park? Nada. My mind jumped right to, don't need the hassle. We weren't in danger. Dude was stuck down there. Figured a hiker fell, probably injured. Someone would surely check it out in the morning, get those emergency crews or whatever. Went back to our romantic campfire like nothing happened. Even cracked a joke. You wouldn't believe it, babe. There's some litter bug right down there. Something like that. Nora laughed. My gut was twisting, though. The whole night, even though we barely got any sleep because of the waves, part of me kept straining to hear someone yell for help from below. Finally, sunrise hit. Took a proper look out. Nothing. No person. No plastic bag. Not a damn thing. Even went ahead and scrambled down. Figured maybe the tide took whatever it was. There wasn't even a place a human could have survived a fall down there. Just jagged rocks and cold salt water. That's where the trip fell apart for good. Nora thought I was nuts. Maybe stress made me hallucinate. Maybe it did. Either way, this tension crept in. A whisper of bad luck just waiting to get louder. Then came the car trouble just outside town, on some winding forest road, middle of nowhere. The campervan's engine just died. Couldn't restart for the life of me. Had to call a tow truck. Guy didn't roll around until the next afternoon. Took one look under the hood, swore, and explained about some busted part the local shop won't even have in stock for days. 
Nora and I just drifted apart after that. Got stuck in a motel right along the highway. Nothing to do but wait and fight. Turns out sharing a space that tiny gets old real fast. On the third night, it got heated. Yelling. Insults. All of it. Took a walk to cool off. Found myself just down by the main road. No idea where I was going till I looked up and saw those motel room lights reflected in the windows of a parked station wagon. It sat across the highway, pointed dead at our room. Figured I'd left something inside, walked closer. That's when I saw him. The silhouette huddled there, framed in that window. Tall, lanky, skin shining pale in the headlights of passing cars. Couldn't make out any other details, but I didn't want to. Turned, got away as fast as possible. Back at the motel, didn't sleep at all. Just sat at the back window, waiting, listening. That shape across the road was still there in the morning, parked as though they hadn't moved an inch all night. We got out of there on that tow truck as soon as the part arrived. Nora barely spoke to me for weeks. Eventually, after more fights and too much silence, we split for good. Maybe we would have anyway. Maybe that camper van was just the catalyst. All I know is, if I hadn't looked away from that guy on the beach, if I hadn't assumed things were simpler than they seemed, maybe he wouldn't have followed us. Because I saw him again after, you know. Sometimes in a crowd, a glimpse of someone tall and too thin in the wrong shadows. Sometimes in the rearview mirror on a dark, empty road. No idea what that thing was, or what it even wanted. Some primal wrongness the cliff spat up when I wasn't looking, I suppose. The ocean keeps its secrets, that's what the postcards say. Maybe better it stayed that way. I remember the unusually chilly evening in September 2016 when my mundane life took a terrifying turn I could have never predicted. My name is Alfred, and at the time I was living in a small town called Springvale, nestled in the dense forests of Maine. The tranquility and isolation that once drew me to this place became catalyst for an unspeakable encounter. It had been a regular Thursday evening. I had returned from a tiring day at work spent some time with my wife Pamela and our two kids, Mary and John, and then decided to go for my routine walk, a chance to clear my head after a long day. There was something unsettling about the darkness that enveloped our familiar tree-lined neighborhood. The faintly lit streetlights cast eerie shadows on the pavement. As I strolled along the empty streets, shivering slightly from the uncharacteristic cold, I found myself approaching an abandoned house at the end of our cul-de-sac. This dilapidated building had always piqued my curiosity, but tonight there was an indescribable sense of foreboding. Suddenly, without warning, I heard heart-stopping screams coming from within the house. The blood-curdling cries triggered my instincts to help whoever was in distress. Gripping my fear tightly as though it were some kind of barrier against harm, I hesitated for a moment before making my way cautiously towards the abandoned house, entering through its creaking door into complete darkness, guided only by the chilling yells that echoed through the decaying walls. A foul smell hit my nostrils like a punch, a nauseating mix of rot and filth. Using my phone's flashlight to navigate through the gloomy interior, I felt like any bad smells would be more bearable than stumbling upon what horrors lay ahead. The screams grew louder and more gut-wrenching as I ascended a decrepit staircase, my heart pounding in my chest like a wild drum. As I reached the second floor, the source of those horrific sounds revealed itself. A young, terrified woman, her clothes torn and covered in blood, staring at me with pleading eyes. Overcome with dread, I tried to reassure her that everything would be okay as I approached to help. Run! They're coming! She screamed before collapsing onto the floor. Her fear ignited my own anxieties, but before I could question her further about what they were, 
we heard rapid footsteps thundering down the hallway behind us. Firmly gripping the woman's arm, I half carried her as we raced towards the nearest window. Our escape was urgent but uncertain. A cacophony of thuds and menacing laughter pierced through the night's silence from the unknown terror that pursued us. In desperation, we hurled ourselves through the decaying window frame into the unforgiving darkness beyond. Bruised and terrified, we picked ourselves up and sprinted down the moon-illuminated streets, desperately trying to outrun whatever nightmare followed us. Treacherous black shadows floated around us like obscure memories threatening to engulf our sanity. Still carrying the injured woman by my side, I dared to glimpse behind me in an attempt to identify our pursuers, and that's when my blood froze in terror. Chasing us with unnatural swiftness were two small children with unnervingly black eyes. Not a single trace of humanity could be found within those soulless pupils. I fought back a scream as we hurried inside my house across town, locking all doors and windows behind us. Though I was unsure if anything could protect us from those dark-eyed devils outside. My mind raced to form an escape plan or map out possible places to hide as Pamela frantically questioned me about what had happened over my frantic panting. All I could do now was lock my family and the injured woman in our basement, issuing a promise to find help. But with our phones dead and no link to the outside, I knew that my odds were slipping like sand through my fingers. My thoughts raced as we hid in the basement. I couldn't bring myself to make a sound, fearing that any noise would give away our location to the vicious children. But then I realized I didn't know my neighbor's phone number and had no alternative but to risk leaving the basement. Keep the door locked, I whispered sternly to Pamela and the injured woman. I'll be back with help as soon as possible. I crept up the stairs, heart pounding, and carefully unlocked and opened the basement door just enough to peer out. To my relief, there was no sign of the children. I tiptoed through the house toward where we kept a spare phone in our home office. As I quietly entered the room, my eyes darted around, searching for any sign of danger. Spotting the phone on the desk, I swiftly dialed my neighbor's number, not wanting to waste a second of precious time that could make all the difference. John, I whispered urgently into the receiver once he answered. There's something, someone after us. We're hiding in our basement right now. Can you please drive over and help us? From his tone, it was clear John sensed my desperation. All right, I'm heading over right now. Stay put and stay quiet. Shortly after hanging up, I heard a car engine roar to life outside. It was John arriving far sooner than I anticipated. As his headlights illuminated my front door, my immediate fear was that those horrifying children would be drawn to his car. But amidst this concern came another worry. When John pulled in too close to our front door, blocking any others from entering, he effectively prevented our escape by trapping us from within. As expected from which nightmares are made, one child appeared from behind a tree near John's car and lunged at him with near unfathomable speed. No, I screamed as I flung open the front door and threw a nearby rock at the child's head, dreading the possibility that John might become yet another victim. The child was rendered unconscious from impact with the large rock, but I knew its incapacitation would only be temporary. Another monstrous child appeared out of nowhere and launched itself at me. John, meanwhile, had recovered enough to grab a shovel from his car and send it crashing into the creature's skull. John and I wasted no time, bolting inside my house and down to the basement. We need to leave now, John insisted. Get your family into my car so we can drive to safety. I was reluctant to drag everyone through the house where our assailants had likely entered. Still, where else could we run? As we exited through the basement window in order not to alert the unknown number of creatures prowling our home, I couldn't help but glance at our pursuers, who began to stir back towards consciousness. John was able to shift his car just enough for us all to pile safely inside before driving off into the night. We were grateful to leave those black-eyed children behind us as we hastily navigated unfamiliar streets, 
trying to find refuge in some distant location. Where are we going? Pamela asked fearfully. To the police, I replied grimly. We need help. These children won't stop hunting us down on their own. The police took our statements with skepticism, but agreed they would come with us to assess our home and gather evidence. Though I couldn't fathom how an investigation could possibly deter these evil entities or restore order, there was no other avenue left for us to follow. It didn't take long for those gaping black eyes to appear again as officers protested the lunacy of our accounts. Still, overpowered by forces beyond their control, they retreated in equal parts horror and disbelief, leaving my family alone and vulnerable once more. In the days that followed, we never saw the black-eyed children again. I thanked John for saving our lives and helping us contact the authorities when it counted the most. We held a small funeral for those we lost during this ordeal, their memories etched into our hearts forevermore. The questions of who they were and why they targeted us remained unanswered, but one thing was certain. Our lives would never be the same after encountering those sinister children with their hollow, obsidian stares. Whoever figured a trip to the vending machine could herald the onset of a nightmare clearly hadn't clocked in at the Hemlock Biogenetics Facility, nestled in a godforsaken forest in the hinterlands of Montana. It's not like you expect sunshine and lollipops working on government black ops projects, but nothing quite prepares you for Thursdays gone bat crazy upside down. My name? Call me Tanner Greaves. You won't find me on any of the usual rolls call or yearbooks. The kind of man who prefers his coffee black, his nights quiet, and his biohazard level 4 pathogens securely behind 3 inch thick containment glass. So, a stolen Twix bar was to blame for what came next. A mischief one of our lab techs, Arlo Petty, swore up and down he had nothing to do with. Wouldn't normally raise an eyebrow if it weren't for Petty's conspicuous wrappers strewn about his workstation, exhibits A through E of his chocoholic tendencies. The lab's unspoken rule, don't snoop around without cause. That went out the window when Petty stopped showing up for his night shifts. Something smelled fishy and wasn't just the microwaved leftovers from the break room. It's usually the quiet ones you gotta watch out for mused our security officer, Coraline Tress. Unpopular by name and by nature, Coraline had eyes sharp enough to lance through lesser lies, but this time, even she couldn't scratch past the surface. We had procedures for AWOL personnel, sure, but procedural rigmarole doesn't account for blood-chilling howls echoing from hemlock shadows after dusk. With dusk stretching its inky fingers over us quicker each day, it was only logical I'd end up trekking into these woods with Coraline on my six and government-issued sidearms, a piece of cold reassurance against whatever kind of hell had crawled out from our petri dishes to take Petty. Our search turned up sweet F.A. until we stumbled upon Petty's ID badge dangling off a bramble like some horror show Christmas decoration. The ground nearby was churned up something fierce, as if a brawl broke out, or worse, Someone had dragged something heavy, unwillingly, deeper into an abyss that shouldn't exist outside campfire ghost stories. Skeptic as I might be, the workaday world doesn't ready you to witness broken branches smeared with fresh maroon paint that your brain screams is blood. It just doesn't. Shout, if you see anything, I called over to Coraline, though half hoping she wouldn't have cause to holler back. It might be... My tongue tripped over words deadlier than any slugs chambered in my glock. Because what if it wasn't petty or something equally mundane? What then? Dialogue text boxes ticked through different nightmarish theories until we reached an unnatural clearing where the moonlight didn't dare pierce the canopy above. A perpetual twilight zone for flora misguided enough to grow here. And there stood petty, or what was once petty, a macabre scarecrow skewered upon splintered wood. 
The sigh slipped silently between set teeth, as anger or resignation who can say. No screams rent our eardrums, since what do you shout when faced with grotesque tableaus nature never intended? Shouting means hope, of rescue or escape. This tableau whispered quite the opposite, but no time for despair's poison when shadows shifted. No spider ever wove darkness into form so monstrous. No lore chronicled creatures like these. Also like nothing scripted by God, nor Darwin's evolutionary penstrokes. Not this abysmally misshapen pariah rendered in charnel cloth draped uneasily upon its frame whence human words would never fall. Logic argued it must have been born from our lab's enigmatic entrails, but still bore such stark strangeness that resisted easy classification as any known biological terror. I turned from Petty, not looking back, not wanting the image carved any deeper into my memory. The path through the dense forest seemed to constrict around me, as if nature itself grieved and sought to choke out intruders. Stumbling forward, I pushed through brush and undergrowth, each snap of twig like a shout through a library hall. There it stood, the creature from Nightmare's Edge, a form not cast from familiar molds. Broad shoulders hinted at power far beyond that of any man. Its skin was a shimmering obsidian that drank light and blurred edges. Eyes were absent from its skull-like face, and yet I felt its gaze. Hollow sockets that seemed to follow as I edged away. The communicator in my pocket was a useless brick. No signal could escape this place. Besides, who would believe this account? Words are flimsy traps for such horrors. It moved without sound sliding between trees like oil through water, a predator amongst shadows. Fleeing sparked the chase, turning away fueled its interest. Retreat was instinct, evasion my survival. It clawed at space where I had stood seconds earlier, thick fingers shredding bark as easily as paper. First it caught Miller with swipes that opened him as one might a fruit, wet sounds of separation marking his end. He gasped for words, but found none. We met eyes briefly before his light dimmed and there was little left to identify. Resisting the urge to clutch at his remains or scream my rebellion at the injustice, I ran. I kept forward momentum, darting past Reggie, who stood transfixed by fear, knowing his fate was sealed in my escape. A sharp yelp behind me signaled another loss. Then silence told of Reggie's report to oblivion, a tale untold save for the blood on leaves. When beacon lights finally broke through trees hours later, spotted by sheer dumb luck rather than skill, I emerged into a ring of uniforms and equipment that buzzed like an excited hive. Words failed me once again, yet they demanded them, taking in my battered form with questions painted on their faces. They searched the woods afterward, found signs of struggle and worse, but no beast of supernatural lore to pin them on. Medical personnel whispered, bear attack, and shook their heads, but the coroner looked puzzled while stitching up the dead. Unnatural patterns danced across torn flesh that didn't match any bear he'd known. Days passed as they do. Life moved on outside those cursed woods. Funerals were held, Petty's empty casket most haunting for its hollow weight. Miller and Reggie's families clung to each other frothing at how random cruelty had snatched their loved ones away. The scar marks on trees made headlines for days until something more tangible took their place. People need something solid to fear, not phantom claws in the dark or voids where answers should lie heavy and neat. I live with eyes now drawn perpetually to Horizon's line, as if expecting dark forms to take shape in casual glances where light still fights shadow valiantly each dusk and dawn. The only vigil I can keep for friends swallowed whole by a world hungry and vast beyond comprehension. Those final moments before humans fade unanswered sit with me still. Steel-gray aftermath where once laughter rang clear. Vision blurred by images better left unseen. Clear-cut knowledge stained deep within that some secrets keep themselves with teeth sharp enough to cut curiosity clean from bone. Out there, 
it waits still, silent chaotic void with presence implied rather than confirmed, steward of questions without form, to prowl scenes that we fabricate but never truly understand or control, leaving only memories like graffiti marked upon life's walls. Here there be monsters. This happened to me on February 26, 2016. Found myself in the kind of tight spot only a fool with empty pockets gets into. Gambling debts, shady characters, the usual mess. Figured the best way to make those problems disappear was to do the same myself. Always loved the wilderness, so I bought a chunk of land, sight unseen up in the Adirondacks. Figured I could live out my days hunting, fishing, far from anyone who wanted a piece of me. They don't call me lucky for nothing. First few months were a dream. Fixed up the old cabin, learned how to set snares, track deer, even got myself a rusty old boat for the lake. The isolation was the best part. A man can think straight when it's just him and the trees. No distractions. Well, except for that first winter. It hit early and hard. Blizzards, ice, the whole nine yards. Took longer than I care to admit to realize I was woefully unprepared. When the woodpile started dwindling, my stomach did too. Figured the storm would let up. I could hike into town for supplies. But the snow just kept coming. Food ran out. Cabin started to feel like a tomb. Got desperate. Strung fishing line across a creek. Rigged a pathetic little ice fishing setup. Didn't expect much. Caught something, though. Problem was, it wasn't a fish. Pulled this... thing up through the hole in the ice. Skinny as a bone. Skin tight like shrink wrap. Fur looked half rotten. What patches there were. But the eyes... They blazed green, full of a wild, unnatural hunger. It hissed and writhed on the line, teeth like needles. I whacked it with a log, cut the line, and watched it slink back into the freezing water. Next time I left the cabin, I brought my rifle. Didn't like that what I saw had human-like hands, the way it moved on its haunches, the way it stared at me, calculating. That thing, it was more than just some sick animal. The tracks were what really got me. Found them all around the cabin, crisscrossing my own. Massive paw prints, but something was off, not quite the shape of any animal I recognized. And every now and then, the prints would switch from paws to something with fingers and toes, long, crooked things that sent a chill down my spine. Started dreaming about it. Nightmares about being hunted, chased through the trees. Woke up shaking, covered in sweat, my rifle clutched to my chest. Sleep became my enemy. Then, one day, I was out gathering firewood when I heard it. A low, rumbling growl from deeper in the woods. Saw a flash of movement between the trees. A hulking shape, mottled fur blending in with the shadows. It was watching me. I bolted back to the cabin, barricaded myself in. Heart hammered in my chest like it wanted to break out. That night, the creature came. I heard it circling the cabin, snarling and growling. The scratching at the door, heavy thuds against the walls. It went on for hours. Just before dawn, it let out a howl that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. A howl full of fury, but also a promise. And then, it was gone. Next morning, I walked out into a world transformed. The tracks in the snow told the story. It had circled the cabin, marking its territory. My sanctuary was now my prison. Didn't have time to think. I packed everything I could carry and abandoned the cabin without a backward glance. Hiked for two days straight, barely stopping to rest. Hard in my throat the whole time. Figured... The further I got from that godforsaken place, the better my chances. Hitched a ride with a trucker hauling logs. Told him my truck broke down. Some story to cover up how rattled I looked. Made it to a bus station and disappeared into the city. Now, 
I stick to crowded streets and cheap motels. Call me paranoid, call me crazy, but I know what I saw. The memory of that creature haunts me, its twisted form, the hunger in its eyes, the feeling of being its prey. Every time I hear a siren wail, a dog bark, a rustle outside my window, some part of me remembers. Remembers that there are places in the world where a man ain't the top of the food chain, places where old things still walk the earth, things best left undisturbed. I learned my lesson, though it was a high price to pay. Nature ain't always pretty. Sometimes she's got teeth and claws and a gaze that'll freeze your soul. Sometimes, the smartest play a man can make is to run and never look back. Maybe those debts weren't so bad after all. Maybe it's best the fellas I owe can't find me. Because if that creature ever does, well, I don't like my odds. My name's Alex Tanner, and this happened to me in 2012. I work solo, mostly. Agency gives me assignments, drops me in the middle of nowhere, then lets me find my own way back. My marriage didn't survive the lifestyle. Ex-wife thinks I'm an accountant, which may be safer for everyone in the long run. This mission started with whispers, rumors of people vanishing in a remote corner of Utah Canyon country. Not tourists, mind you, locals old-timers who knew the back trails. Folks assumed they'd just gotten lost until some of their remains turned up. Now, remains out in the wilderness aren't that unusual. Accidents happen. Animal attacks, sure. But these, they showed a kind of violence beyond cougars or wolves. The reports had me puzzled. Messy. Overkill, but with a strange precision. The locals were spooked, talking of something monstrous, something not natural. That's where I come in. The canyons were a maze of red rock and shadows when I set out, hiked in under cover of darkness, set up camp in a hidden gully. Place gives me the creeps, to be honest. A stillness, unnatural for the desert. Even the insects seemed subdued. Spent two days watching, waiting. Third night, it happened near full moon. I dozed off and woke to a prickling at the back of my neck. Movement in the darkness, slow, purposeful. My night vision's decent. I saw the silhouette against the skyline. Thing was huge, loping on two legs with an awkward grace, too elongated to be human, too controlled to be an animal. There was intelligence in its movements, a chilling sort of focus. The next moments are a blur, I grabbed my rifle, not sure if it'd work against this, but something was better than nothing. It saw me then. It let out a hissing wail and lunged. I fired, two shots, and it didn't even slow. I scrambled back, gun clattering from my grip and tripped on a rock. The thing was on me in a flash. It had hands, long-fingered and tipped with what looked like claws. One slashed across my chest. Pain exploded, white and blinding. I managed to grab my backup pistol and fired point-blank. The creature screeched and stumbled back, giving me space to roll away. I glimpsed the damage I'd done. Holes in its torso leaking some kind of black, oily fluid. Yet, it still moved. Still stared at me with those burning eyes. There was no winning this fight. I turned and ran, fumbling through the darkness... I heard it crashing after me, but the canyons were a labyrinth. I sprinted, dodged, stumbled for what felt like hours. Sweat stung my eyes, blood pounded in my ears. Had to keep running. Had to survive. Finally, I risked a glance back. Nothing. I slumped to the ground, lungs aching, chest throbbing. That's when I heard the whimpering. A young woman was huddled a few yards away staring at me with wide, frightened eyes. She was trembling, covered in dirt and scratches. I thought... I thought it had... She swallowed, voice hoarse. Been running for days. Turns out her name was Sarah, 
local hiker who'd ventured too far off the trail. The creature had snatched her three nights ago. Somehow she'd kept ahead of it, kept hidden. That takes guts I can barely fathom. Getting out of there was another hell. Dawn was breaking, and that meant danger. The creature, it didn't like the light. We took our chances, picked our way out of the canyons, found a ranger station, made up a story about a wild bear. They don't need to know the truth. Neither does anyone else. The agency patched me up, asked their usual questions. I gave them half-truths, enough to keep them satisfied without revealing the scale of the thing out there. Sarah vanished. Smart move. Best to make a fresh start after something like that. I've healed, mostly. The scars itch sometimes. Remind me. There are dark corners of this world where the maps end, where things that shouldn't exist still lurk and hunt. The agency wants me on another assignment. Up in Alaska this time. I've got no choice, really. Out there, the monsters have different names, different forms. But that hunger in the darkness... That's always the same. It's not every day that your belief in the impossible gets challenged. Well, not unless your job involves dabbling with the very threads of life. That's what I do, or rather, what I did, until things took a turn for the surreal. I worked at a secluded facility nestled deep within the forests of the Pacific Northwest, far from prying eyes. This is where the U.S. government conducted secret genetic experiments, and my name is Emmerich Lowry. My life was a cycle of strict routines and protocols until that chilly morning when my colleague Dr. Quintina Vogel rushed into the lab out of breath. Droplets of sweat formed a stark contrast on her pale skin as she managed to whisper, Something's gone wrong with Subject E-57. It's gruesome. The facility went on immediate lockdown. An emergency meeting convened in the central hub. My team, consisting of Dr. Vogel, our security head Marcellus Hinder, and I gathered around flickering screens that displayed a horrid sight. Subject E-57 was no longer in its containment unit. Whatever it was now was something else entirely its form reminiscent of a wendigo from Native American folklore, only with bone structures protruding like makeshift armor. As we debated our next move with growing apprehension, joking half-heartedly about needing the pay rise this kind of situation should warrant, alarms blared and radio chatter became frantic. Security personnel were reporting something large moving through the corridors. Chaos erupted, when Marcellus received confirmation via radio that two guards had been found, or what was left of them. It wasn't pretty. Their remains painted a picture of marauding brutality I'd only seen in crime scene photos. We knew we had to act quickly and arm ourselves. Rifles were distributed as we set out on what felt like a hunt more than a containment procedure. Yet none of us truly understood the nature of what we were dealing with. We split up into teams, Marcellus leading one while Dr. Vogel insisted on joining me. Strength in numbers, she said, her voice trying to mask the fear we all shared. We're scientists, not soldiers, Quintina quipped, as we checked our weapons once more before delving into the dimly lit corridors. Maybe today we're both, I retorted, with an attempt at lightheartedness that fell flat in the sterile air. Moving cautiously through our own workspace now felt alien and threatening. This place that had been familiar for so long instantly transformed by this unforeseen horror loosed amongst us. Every shadow made us jumpy. Every sound was magnified until it seemed even our own breaths echoed like distant drumbeats throughout the expanse of tree-shrouded halls bleached by sterile light. Then all pretense of civilization vanished when we rounded a corner to find it. This creature born from our tampering, mutilating another victim in the cold glow of fluorescent lights. The scene tugged at my stomach and twisted it into knots. Eyes wild and reflecting some unholy hunger, 
It appeared almost human if not for disproportionate limbs that ended in sharp, jagged points, like nature's mishandled sculpting tools. The bloodstains on its chest could have been war paint, heralding its triumph over mankind's arrogance. Quintina and I froze. The creature looked at us with a sense that it recognized our presence as a threat. We couldn't fight what we didn't understand, and this thing before us was beyond comprehension. Back, I whispered, each word an effort to push out. We retreated, stepping over debris, our minds racing for escape routes. The creature, lost in its grotesque indulgence, paid no heed to the sound of our cautious steps. We reached the lab and barricaded the door. Quintina glanced at the phone, then at me. Signal's dead, she said, her voice strained under the weight of our predicament. The lab was a dead end, a place of research and progress, now a potential tomb. Quintina moved to the cabinets, looking for anything useful. Our eyes met for a brief moment. No words were needed. The creature's shadow snaked into the room under the door crack. It was looking for more. Its silhouette seemed larger now, thicker limbs, sharper angles. I thought of calling out, screaming for someone to hear us, but realized that we hadn't seen any of our colleagues since... Since when? Time had become a blur of fear and flight. Quintina handed me a fire extinguisher, the only weapon we had against an inhuman force. We waited as the scratching on the other side grew frantic. Then it ceased suddenly. Moments stretched, neither of us daring to breathe too loud lest we attract attention again. With nothing but seconds ticking by, we made a decision. Quintina nodded toward the ventilation ducts. We removed the heavy metal grate and climbed through the narrow paths, emerging into another section away from our pursuer. Days passed as we hid and moved through our transformed workplace. We found ourselves in a server room on what could have been day three or five. Each moment felt indistinct from the last. The power flickered. The creature had damaged essential systems during its relentless search for prey. Mere survival kept us one step ahead of it, but every space we entered held an imprint of its presence, dismembered limbs or half-devoured remains. Since escape was not an option, Quintina suggested that we climb again into another set of ducts leading up towards maintenance access panels on the roof. It became clear to us. No one else was alive here to hear our cries for help. When we reached the roof, rescue greeted us in the form of helicopter searchlights scanning over this facility thrown into darkness amidst power failures. An island held captive by this aberration. Rescue teams secured us with harnesses, while one brave soul asked what had happened inside with a trembling voice that betrayed their dread of knowing too much. We don't know, I replied honestly, as I looked over at Quintina, who wore an identical expression of haunted ignorance. As we ascended away from that hellish sight below us, I realized then that there were things people were never meant to tamper with that some curiosities leave scars deeper than physical injuries. The only marker for those lost within that place was silence, a void where vibrant life should have been. And in my mind would linger those hopeful faces unaware of their fate at the hands and appetite, of something unknown and fierce birthed from human error. This happened to me on July 4th, 1991. Took a wrong turn in life, wound up divorced, a rusty trailer my only home. Figured getting back to nature, off on my own, might sort my head out. Name's Wyatt. Wyatt Reed. Found a piece of land on the cheap, tucked away in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. Miles of thick pine forest, a glacial lake practically in my backyard, should have been paradise first few months it was. Hiked the old logging roads, taught myself to fish, fixed up the old cabin on the property. Didn't see another living soul for weeks at a time, and I wasn't complaining. Turns out, 
solitude can be addictive, especially when you're running from your problems. Then the noises started. Couldn't pinpoint when exactly. Just a gradual unease that settled into my bones. A rustle in the bushes that didn't sound like a deer or a raccoon. A sense of eyes on me, hot and heavy, when I ventured too far into the trees. Found the first tracks by the lake. They were massive, clawed, not anything I recognized. Tried to tell myself it was a deformed bear, maybe one injured in a fight. But deep down I didn't believe it. That night, I heard it for the first time. A howl so deep it rattled the cabin windows. Not a wolf, not a coyote. It was the sound of pure, hungry rage echoing through the valley. I barricaded the door, loaded my shotgun, and didn't sleep a wink. Days turned into a tense, watchful routine. I scanned the tree line constantly, every snap of a branch sending my heart into overdrive. I started finding things, remnants of my woodpile scattered like a dog had torn through it, deep gouges in the trees outside my cabin, and always the feeling of being watched. One morning, I discovered the carcass of a doe near the creek. It had been half-eaten, stripped in a way no predator I knew would do. Next to the carcass was a single monstrous footprint sunk deep into the mud. That's when I knew something unnatural was stalking me. I debated leaving, but a stubborn part of me refused. This was my land, damn it, and I wasn't about to be chased off it by some... some monster, packed up supplies, retreated deeper into the woods, figured if it wanted to hunt me, it would have to find me first. I holed up in an abandoned prospector's shack half a day's hike from my cabin. The structure was ramshackle but sturdy. I boarded up the windows, reinforced the door, laid traps around the perimeter, and waited. It came on the third night. I heard it circling the shack, its snarls low and guttural. The scratching of claws against the weathered wood sent shivers down my spine. I sat huddled in a corner, shotgun clutched in my sweating hands, whispering prayers I hadn't uttered since childhood. The attack came at dawn. It slammed into the shack, the wood groaning and splintering. I fired the shotgun through a gap in the boards, the roar deafening in the confined space. I heard a yelp of pain, then silence. I held my breath, listening. Had I hit it? Wounded it? Scared it off? Then the roof started to tear off. I fired again, blindly. I heard the thud of something massive hitting the ground, followed by a furious roar. Fumbled in the dark to reload, hot tears streaming down my face. This was it. This was how I died. Suddenly, I heard shouting. Men's voices rough and unfamiliar. More gunshots echoed, then a series of inhuman howls retreating into the trees. When the sun rose, I stumbled out of the wrecked shack into blinding daylight. Three men stood there, park rangers or game wardens I guessed from the uniforms. They looked at me, then at the shack, and back at me, like they couldn't believe their eyes. What the hell happened here? One of them asked, his voice tinged with awe and a little fear. I just shook my head. Couldn't find the words to describe the creature I'd seen glimpses of in the dim light. Its hunched form, its glowing eyes, the sheer power it moved with. They found the creature half a mile away, dead. It was enormous, like a bear that walked on two legs. Its fur was patchy its face twisted into a hideous snarl. One of the rangers swore, hand going to the cross around his neck. Skinwalker, he whispered, and there was a reverence in his voice I couldn't place. They questioned me for hours. I told them the truth, or as close to it as I could manage. They didn't believe in monsters, not really. Chalked it up to a bear attack, a rogue with some kind of disease. Didn't matter to me what they thought. I knew what I saw, packed up what I could salvage and hitched a ride back to civilization the next day. Never looked back. 
Turns out there's some kinds of wilderness a man's not meant to face alone. Some things the city's safer for, even with all its noise and crowds. Don't get me wrong, I still miss the quiet, the freedom of the woods. But at night, when I hear a siren wail, or the rumble of a distant train, I remember that howl, those glowing eyes in the darkness. And I offer up a silent thanks for concrete, streetlights, and the company of strangers.